Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the Luffy Fanfix, back with the amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What If Luffy Trained by Dark King to Became Godlike Nika. Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. How long are you gonna lay there like a moron? Our story begins with a memory of two brothers staring out into the ocean from a cliff. The boy who spoke first was Porgas Diaz, the eldest. Ace is a ten-year-old boy with curly black hair and freckles on his face. He wore a green sleeveless t-shirt with the two kanji phrases for innocence and violence on the front, and a black elbow guard on his left arm. Below that were his black knee-length shorts and dark brown slippers on his feet. His face was riddled with bandages on his nose, left cheek, and forehead, courtesy of injuries he sustained during a recent fight for his life, as well as his brothers. Speaking of which, let's move on to the youngest, Monkey D. Luffy. Luffy is a seven-year-old boy with shaggy black hair. His special feature was the crescent-shaped scar with three stitches under his left eye. He wore a purple sleeveless shirt, blue cargo shorts with white cuffs, and a pair of sandals. But what sticks out more was Luffy's treasured straw hat with a red band, which he was clutching tightly over his head while he lies on the grass, sulking. By the way, the treasure we were keeping in the forest is gone, Ace said, crossing his arms. Luffy didn't respond. His only reaction was silent sobs. Recently, Ace, Luffy, and their late brother, Sabo, were working together to prepare for the day that they would go out to sea and live the life of free men, pirates. To do so, the trio honed their survival skills by hunting large wild beasts fighting street thugs, stealing from nobles, and saving up money to fund their voyage. However, they barked up the wrong tree when they decided to steal money from a crew of vicious pirates, the Blue Gem Pirates. Fearing that their treasure stash may have been compromised, Ace and Sabo relocated every last doubloon with haste. Unfortunately, Luffy was stupid enough to get captured by the pirates, who later began torturing Luffy for information. But he never spoke. Ace and Sabo considered the possibility, and stormed in to rescue their little brother. After the incident, the boys managed to escape with their lives, but Luffy was nearly traumatized from the painful experience he just had, but he was able to keep a brave face. Unfortunately, that incident was just the prologue to another tragedy. To the north of their forest playground was the Grey Terminal, a scrapyard full of criminals and dirty dealings to go with them. Beyond that was a city with a high, solid stone wall, handily keeping the nearby criminals at arm's length. Beyond the wall lies many residential building which houses those with noble blood. This was the shining jewel of the Goa Kingdom, the capital of Dawn Island, said to be the most beautiful place in the East Blue. Not a hint of trash could be found on its streets. During an excursion to the Goa Kingdom, the three brothers attempted to trade in some crocodile skin while posing as an adult by stacking on top of each other while wearing a full body cloak. Unbeknownst to Ace and Luffy, they discovered that Sabo is a runaway noble. Sabo explained to his brothers that he ran away to avoid an arranged marriage to a royal family. His parents cared more about status than their son. Ace and Luffy took it surprisingly well, saying it doesn't matter where Sabo came from. They each shared the same dream. Things got worse, though, when Sabo was then captured by the Blue Gem Pirates, who were hired by his father to bring him back home. When they did, he was introduced to his newly adopted noble brother, Steli. Sabo was shocked that his parents already considered replacing him. He was later informed provocatively by Steli that Grey Terminal was due to be set ablaze the following day. The aristocracy planned to burn away the trash outside the city, along with its inhabitants, to make a good impression for the upcoming visit of the Celestial Dragons, the descendants of the founders of the world government. A group of important people, including a world noble, were sent to inspect the East Blue for a suitable candidate to join their ranks. Sabo could no longer stand living in such a dark country that felt like a prison. On the night of the fire, Sabo escapes from his home to try and warn the denizens of Grey Terminal of the impending disaster but arrived too late. The Blue Gym Pirates, once again hired by the nobles, were charged with the task of starting the fire, only to find out later that they were conned. They were promised a noble status and titles as a reward for their deeds, only to find themselves trapped in the fire with the entrance to the city locked tight. Failing to prevent the many needless death in Grey Terminal, Sabo, in despair, was then approached by a hooded man in the deserted streets who asks what's wrong. That man was Monkey D. Dragon, leader of the Revolutionary Army as well as Luffy's father. Sabo confines the truth of the fire to Dragon and that the nobles and king are responsible. He goes on to say that the kingdom smells worse than the Grey Terminal, as well as its people, and as long as he stays in the kingdom, he will never be free. Dragon was greatly shocked at what Sabo said and that the Goa Kingdom, the place of his birth, has now forced their children to say such things. Meanwhile, at Grey Terminal, the remaining squatters that haven't burned down were getting closer to a fiery death, until an unnatural gust of wind created a safe path through the fire, leading to a ship at the coast. The ship belonged to the Revolutionary Army, 
with some of its members on board, including Dragon. The leader then welcomes those who desire to fight for their freedom onto his ship before sailing away. Ace and Luffy soon found themselves thrown into the mix. In their attempt to bring back Sabo, they also got trapped in the fire. But in the mass hysteria and confusion, the trapped Blue Gem Pirates, outmatched, the boys were nearly killed until they were saved by their adopted family, Curly Daddon and the Mountain Bandits. During the struggle, Daddon and Ace stay behind to fight Blue Jam and his crew, while the rest of the Mountain Bandits and Luffy make a quick escape. The following day, Ace and Daddon return to the Bandits' hideout to the relief of Luffy and the other Bandits. One of the Bandits, Dagra, later returns from town to inform them of some tragic news. In the meantime, Sabo was later recaptured by the police and brought back to his prison, home, fully accepting that he will never find freedom here. He leaves the island the day the Celestial Dragon is set to arrive. Sabo commandeers a small ship, flying a Jolly Roger, and attempts to set sail. But his ship was quickly destroyed by a world noble, supposedly killing Sabo along with it. Later, Ace discovers a letter left behind by Sabo. The letter tells Ace to take care of Luffy. This brings us to the current moment. Luffy went to the Cape by himself to mourn Sabo's death. Ace soon discovers him and continues his speech. Someone must have gotten to it. Survivors from Blue Gem's crew must have taken it, or maybe the military. Either way, there's nothing we can do at this point. Nah, I don't care about the treasure. Not anymore. I mean, those were pirate savings I was sharing with Sabo. And you too, later on, I guess. But in the end, he didn't need money to set sail. So why should I get bent out of shape about it? After all, what's the point in having treasure if you can't even protect it? Luffy finally responds with a sniffle, Hey, Ace. I, Ace looks down at him. I want to get stronger. Stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Stronger and stronger. Stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. I want to be the strongest in the world. And then, I'll protect everyone. I won't lose anyone I care about. Ace turns his gaze back to the ocean. You gotta make me a promise, Luffy continued. I'm begging you. Please don't die, Ace. Cut it out. Ace exclaimed and bonked Luffy on his head. Although the latter barely felt it, you ought to be worried about dying before I do. What did you forget? You're a lot weaker than me. Listen, and you listen up good. I'm never going to die. Luffy sits back up, still clinging to his straw hat, and nods his weeping head. His tears and snot ran down his face. You know, Sabo told me to take care of you. So I promise, I'm not gonna die, okay? Never. At least. Not as long as I've got a wussy little brother who needs me to protect him. Why yeah, okay, Luffy whimpered, smarts aren't exactly my strong point, so, I still don't really understand why Sabo was killed, but, whoever did it, they must be opposed to freedom, because they shot him down before he even got a taste of it, but we shared that same cup of sake with him and were still alive. Luffy was beginning to calm down, thanks to his big brother's comforting words, before they lost Sabo, the trio stole a bottle of sake from Daddon and shared it between them, Ace believed that all it takes to become brothers is to share some sake. Whether they were together or apart, on different crews or different ships, they each shared the same dream of living freely. And most of all, they would always be brothers. Luffy, listen to me, okay. Ace continued, there's only one way to live without any regrets. Luffy, still sniffling, nodded, MMHM. Someday, we're gonna set sail, just like Sabo. We're gonna live the way we want to live, more free than anyone else. <laughs> Sounds of gunfire, cannon fire, swords clinging against sword, and cries of battle erupted throughout the frozen battlefield of Marineford. Many men, both marine and pirate alike, were dropping like flies on both sides without either side giving an inch. This historical battle was known as the War of the Best. Ace, also referred to as Fire Fist Ace, and second division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, was captured by the same pirate he pursued to punish for betraying his crew by committing the most unforgivable sin a pirate could, killing one of his fellow crew members, claiming the spoils, and then jump ship. That traitor was known as Marshal D. Teach, Aka Blackbeard, a power-hungry pirate who got his hands on the world's most powerful known loja-type devil fruit, the Dark Dark Fruit. He concocted an elaborate plan to gain even more power by capturing Ace, who was once his superior among the Whitebeard pirates before his betrayal, and handing him over to the navy and gaining a position as one of the seven warlords of the seas. With that title, he also gained the privilege of accessing Impel Down, the world's most secure underwater prison. He snuck in with the intent of going down to the lowest level of the prison and recruiting the most heinous and irredeemable villains in the world. The perfect addition to his pirate crew, Straw Hat Luffy learned of Ace's situation and set out to go rescue his brother from execution. 
but he wasn't alone. Edward Newgate, Aka Whitebeard, captain of the Whitebeard Pirates, the strongest man in the world, one of the four emperors, an adopted father of Ace, retaliated to the threat of Ace's death by answering the call to war. He gathered all his forces and allies to lead a full-scale assault on the stronghold of the Marine. Both sides brought their best to the table in a power struggle of such a high magnitude that the outcome would decide the beginning and the end of an era. Luffy joined the fight, creating chaos wherever he went, all to save his brother's life. He teamed up with Whitebeard, as well as some new allies and past enemies he made. At first, Luffy failed to break Ace out of Impel Down before they transferred him to Marineford for his public execution. But with his miraculous good luck, he prevailed through every obstacle that got in his way, eventually leading him to a war zone. But the chaos was far from over. Luffy had to fight through his own grandfather, Vice Admiral Monkey D. Garp, Aka Garp the Fist, and Hero of the Marines. Garp had more than enough strength to stop his rebellious grandson but didn't have to heart to kill his own king. Ace, we're getting you out of here. Luffy, no. But his luck wasn't enough to save Ace. After succeeding to free Ace from his restraints, the two brothers rushed to flee from the battle with what's left of his crew, only to fall for a taunt by Marine Admiral Sakazuki, Aka Akainu. The ruthless user of the Magma Magma Fruit called Whitebeard a coward for running from a fight. Ace's pride couldn't allow that remark to go uncorrected. Turning around, despite Luffy's pleas, Ace charged at the Admiral in rage, attacking with a fist of fire granted to him by eating the Flame Flame Fruit. Despite his best efforts, fire was no match for magma. Luffy wanted to stop Ace from throwing his life away after he just saved him, but was too weak and exhausted from fighting for so long. In an attempt to strike at Luffy while he was vulnerable, Akainu's molten fist was blocked by Ace, who now had a burning hole right through his torso. On the ground was a small piece of paper, a Viva card. One minute it was whole, the next, it was quickly burning away. A Viva card is a special paper that represents the life force of its owner. This one belonged to Ace. He gave it to Luffy some time ago, telling him that that paper would reunite them one day. But now, it's the countdown to Ace's inevitable demise. Luffy couldn't believe what he witnessed. He couldn't look at anything but Ace who stood there, gritting his teeth after he coughs up blood as if knowing that his life is about to end. Luffy stared with eyes wide and full of disbelief. Ace, Akainu pulled back his fist, still burning, but Ace refused to cry out in pain. Ace fell forward, landing in Luffy's arms. The younger brother lifted his hand from the hole in Ace's back to find it covered in blood. Sorry, Luffy. Ace whispered in his now broken voice, I tried. Don't worry, we'll get you some help, Luffy said fearfully. Ace, despite the state he was in, couldn't help but smile. Thank you for trying so hard, but this is as far as I can go. Come on, what are you saying? This isn't over yet. Luffy's words were only getting harder to say. Before Akainu could finish what he started, two division commanders of the Whitebeard Pirates, Marco the Phoenix and Flower Sword Vista, joined the scene to stop the Mad Admiral. They both succeeded in pushing him back. Giorar, Marco growled, we were so close. Don't give up yet. We still have a chance. Vista shouted. Akainu, now with a large magma leaking welt across his neck, hissed in pain, you're too late. Marco and Vista pressed on with their attacks. This way, doctor, quick, exclaimed one of the nearby Whitebeard pirates, it's not looking good. A man with a black coat, top hat, and doctor's bag approached Ace from behind to examine the wound, but he feared the worst. I can feel my life, Ace struggled to say, slipping away. So, listen to me, Luffy. Ace, there is one thing. That hurts, Ace confessed softly, I won't be around, to see you fulfill your dream. Tears were now weeping out of Luffy's eyes. I know you can do it, because you're my little brother, Ace said, gently panting for air. Do you remember that day? I did it. I lived with no regrets, even though it ended this way. Can't complain now. Well, I can. Luffy wailed, you can't die like this. Sure, things could have gone better, but it's alright. Luffy's tears now lead to sobs. I can't raise my voice anymore. I'm too weak. Tell everyone else. What I'm about to say, all right. Not wanting to miss a single word. Luffy drowned out the noise of the surrounding battlefield to hear Ace's final words. But, he still couldn't accept the fact that Ace was dying. He lost one brother before, to which he declared that he would get stronger no matter what it takes, so he wouldn't have to go through that pain again. Pops, my family, and you. Luffy, thank you, for caring about someone like me, who has bad blood in his veins. Ace whispered as the last tears he'll ever shed now pours down his cheeks, mixed in with his blood. Despite everything that's happened, Ace sounded so happy. Thank you for loving me. Thank you so much. With those final words, Ace smiled as his eyes slowly shut for good. His whole body slackens as if trying to stay in Luffy's arms for just a moment longer. But all the strength he had left had all but slipped away. And he fell. Ace was dead. The Viva card burned to nothing. Never before had Luffy been filled with so much feeling and pain as he does now. Stunned, Luffy's arms fell to his side, looking down desperately.
He spotted the gaping hole that destroyed the mark of the Whitebeard Pirates on Ace's back. A mark that was his pride. A mark he used to shield his kid brother from the fate that claimed him instead. Ace's face held no pain, though. In the end, it was full of peace, complete with a smile. But what troubled Ace deep down before he died was that he was unable to fulfill his promise to Saba. Ace, his brother's blood was still dripping off his hands, his chest getting tighter and tighter. Ace's dying words echoed in his ears. He could barely hear the cries and screams of Ace's comrades as they mourned their fallen friend, unable to hold in all the built-up despair. Luffy's whimpers turned to cries and screams that grew louder and louder. And with one last shriek of pain and shock, he raised his head to the sky. Dot 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 then darkness fell. Luffy gasped, eyes widened as he sat upright wearing nothing but his blue shorts and sandals, as well as some bandages wrapped around his abdomen and right upper arm. What was new was the X-shaped scar on his chest, courtesy of Akainu after he blacked out from what he'd been told. His trademark straw hat, though, was missing. He was dripping with sweat from head to toe and panting desperately for air and staring around wildly as if predators were hiding in the darkness of the night. Did you have a nightmare? Asked a concerned voice. Luffy looks up to see his mentor, Rayleigh. The old man approached him, holding a drink of some kind as if he expected something like this. Dark King Silver's Rayleigh is an elderly man in his 70 seconds with a well-built body. His white facial hair was arranged and battled across his lower jaw. He has a long and old vertical scar over his right eye, which was behind his round glasses. He was dressed in a plain t-shirt, shorts, sandals, and a large silver hooded cloak draped over it all with the hood down. He met Luffy when he and his crew arrived at Sabayati Archipelago, located at the very end of Paradise, the first half of the Grand Line. He's a retired pirate who once served as the first mate and right hand of the late Gaul D. Roger, the King of the Pirates. Because of this, Rayleigh, despite his old age, was an extremely powerful individual. After his old crew disbanded 22 years ago, he became a coding mechanic working at Sabayati Archipelago. He quickly became friends with Luffy and his crew, the Straw Hat Pirates, after they discovered him at a slave trading auction house, posing as a slave. He was planning on robbing whoever bought him before escaping as a free man again. After learning of Luffy's whereabouts after the war, Rayleigh swam to the island of Amazon Lily, an empire ruled by the Kuja, a tribe made up of entirely female warriors, located in the Calm Belt. When he arrived there, Rayleigh offered Luffy two choices on what he wanted to do next, meet up with his crew and go to the New World, the second half of the Grand Line, unprepared, or stay and train for two years. You're covered in sweat, Rayleigh added. Luffy slowly looks up at him fearfully, as if expecting him to be Akainu. Rayleigh holds out the mug to the young man, here, try drinking this. Luffy desperately takes it and doesn't think twice before chugging down the contents almost as quickly as a certain friend of his with a good bottle of booze. There you go, Rayleigh reassured. After losing his big brother, Ace, during the War of the Best at Marineford, Monkey D. Luffy was left in a fragile state, both mentally and physically, for a while. Miraculously, he escaped thanks to the assistance of Trafalgar D. Waterlaw, the Surgeon of Death, Captain of the Heart Pirates, and fellow Supernova in his submarine. For three straight days, Luffy was in a medically induced coma after blacking out. Thanks to Law's generous medical services, Luffy's injuries were on the path to healing, but his mind was still shattered. The first thing Luffy noticed when he gained consciousness was that he was back in the jungles of Amazon Lily. Looking down, he saw that his entire body was covered head to toe in bandages, looking almost like a mummy. His thoughts were interrupted by recollecting memories of what went down at Marineford and what he had lost. The visions drove Luffy berserk, which drove him to destroy the trees and boulders around him. Even while completely wrapped in bandages, Luffy was slowing down, nor did he feel the pain of his wounds reopening. After an unforeseen amount of time had passed, Luffy finally calmed down, now breathing heavily. Feeling his strength leaving him, he dropped down to all fours and noticed he was bleeding out of the various spots of his bandages. He was then approached by a large figure, a whale shark fishman who Luffy met and impel down where he was held prisoner. This was Knight of the Sea Jim, a former member of both the Sun Pirates and the Seven Warlords of the Sea. He resigned from the latter during the War of the Best for refusing to participate in the battle. Before the war, Jim was freed from Impel Down by Luffy after he made it to the lowest level of the prison. In return, Jim offered to repay his liberator by assisting him in Ace's rescue. After the war ended, Jim accompanied Luffy and Law's submarine back to Amazon Lily, convincing Luffy that he wasn't dreaming. Jim could only watch as Luffy cried his eyes out while yelling out Ace's name. Before Luffy could go on another temper tantrum, Jin was able to pin him down and remind him of what he has left in this world. Luffy still has his crew, remembering that he had to meet them back at Sabayati Archipelago, where they first got separated. Luffy and Jin walked back to the coast where the Heart Pirates docked their submarine. It was at that time that Rayleigh appeared from the ocean, saying that he swam through the calm belt which was overcrowded with sea kings. 
But knowing his strength, nobody was surprised. Out of the two choices Rayleigh gave to Luffy, he decided to be smart for once and choose to hold off on meeting up with his crew to train for two years. After getting the message across to the scattered members of the Straw Hat Pirates, the Kuja Pirates, led by Pirate Empress Boa Hancock, one of the seven warlords of the seas offered to take them to the nearby island of Lascana, which is a harsh island with 48 seasons per year which changes almost weekly. Not to mention it was inhabited by colossal beasts that were at least more than 10 times their usual size. It was the perfect place to train. Three months had passed since Rayleigh started training Luffy in the arts of hacking. Haki was the mysterious power that allows the user to utilize their willpower and spiritual energy for various purposes. Rayleigh explained and demonstrated the different forms of Haki to Luffy on the first day of their training. There were three separate categories of Haki, Observation Haki, Armament Haki, and Conqueror's Haki. Observation Haki gives the user a sixth sense of the world around them, allowing them to sense the presence, strength, and emotions of other people. It also grants limited precognitive abilities allowing the user to sense their opponent's intentions and predict their actions and attacks before they happen. Armament Haki allows the user to use their spiritual energy as armor to defend against attacks, as well as make their attacks more potent. It can also be used to bypass the defenses of devil fruit powers that make the user somewhat invincible, such as loja intangibility. A person can apply armament hacky to a section of their body, over their entire body, and even imbue it onto their weapons. Conqueror's hacky, the rarest form of hacky, allows the user to exert their willpower over others. This type of hacky cannot be attained through training, and only one in several million people are born with this ability. It is said that one in a million people who can possess this type of hacky have the qualities of a king otherwise known as the color of the Supreme King. After witnessing Rayleigh's demonstrations on a giant wild elephant, Luffy recalled moments on his journey when he subconsciously used Conqueror's Haki, but didn't know what it was. He also recalled witnessing certain people use Observation Haki, as well as being on the receiving end of Armament Haki. After Luffy finished his drink, he looked around until his eyes stopped at the large campfire that was cooking up a large chunk of meat that he would happily eat later. Do you feel okay? Rayleigh asked. Not really, Luffy answered hesitantly. Rayleigh cocked an eyebrow. Hmm, what's wrong? It's not enough. What, you need a refill? Not the drink, my training. Luffy, it's only been a few months and you're already making a lot of progress. Rayleigh reminded him, you can use armament hacky most of the time now. Your observation hacky is getting good, but still needs work, and you've just started working on that new fourth gear of yours. We still have 21 months of training left, so why do you say it's now enough? I know I'm getting stronger, but... Luffy lowered his head, staring into his empty mug. I just don't think it'll be enough. I want to be even stronger than I thought imaginable. I want to be able to protect my friends and their dreams. Luffy paused. I. I trained for years before I set out to sea. By the time I left my home village, I was already the strongest pirate in the East Blue. When I first got to the Grand Line, I started running into fighters who were more challenging than the last. My first big challenge was Crocodile. The former warlords. Yeah, him. He was the second loja I ever fought and I lost to him twice before I finally took him down. Second, who was the first? The first was that smoky guy that I met in Logtown. He's a Marine. You mean Commodore Smoker? Luffy gave his mentor a questionable look. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, Rayleigh ignored Luffy's obliviousness. Anyway, you were saying. Right. Anyway, after losing to Crocodile more than once, I know that it was only a matter of time before I run into even stronger enemies than him. That's when I found out about Second Gear. To be honest, I learned it by accident. Yes, you showed it to me a while ago. Rayleigh reminisced while stroking his beard. You used your elasticity to accelerate your blood flow, burning through more nutrients and oxygen. It makes you move a lot faster. A process that would kill any normal person. Yeah, Luffy nodded in agreement, but Chopper tells me that it was taxing on my body. I love the technique, but if it destroys my body, I'm not gonna get much done. Third gear is pretty much the same, and fourth gear is even harder. Yes, there's the drawback of third gear that shrinks to the size of a toddler for about a minute after you release all that air in your bones. But it's too soon to know what you can do with fourth gear. You still need to master your hacky. I'm not worried about my hacky, it's just. Luffy paused. I don't think I'm using my devil fruit powers to the fullest. You know, come to think of it. Rayleigh pondered. Catching Luffy's attention, you said the name of your fruit was the gum gum fruit, right? Luffy nodded. Rayleigh went over to his backpack and pulled out four books. Three of them had very similar covers, but the other one looks like it hasn't even been published. Devil Fruit Encyclopedia I by Dr. Vegapunk. Devil Fruit Encyclopedia 2 by Dr. Vegapunk. Devil Fruit Encyclopedia 3 by Dr. Vegapunk. Devil Fruit Encyclopedia X. What are those? Luffy asked. These are the latest Devil Fruit Encyclopedia books that I acquired in the New World many years ago, back when I sailed with my old crew. 
They're extremely hard to get, especially the complete set. They were written by the world government's lead scientist, Dr. Vegapunk, the smartest man alive. So, Luffy seemed uninterested. If we can find your fruit in these books, maybe you'll learn something new. Now, let me take a look. Paramisha, right? Rayleigh asked, while already flipping through the pages of the Paramisha book. Uh-huh. Skimming through the alphabetized catalog of devil fruits, Rayleigh stopped when he got to G. Why don't you grab a bite off the spit while I do some quick research, Luffy? You look hungry, the old man said, not looking up from his book. Yeah, meat. After several minutes of eating his fill, Luffy patted his now fat belly like a bongo. He let out a satisfied sigh after licking his fingers clean. Find anything yet, Rayleigh? Luffy asked, turning towards his mentor. Yes and no, Rayleigh answered ominously. Huh? Luffy cocked an eyebrow in disbelief. There's no record of a gum gum fruit anywhere in the Paramisha volume, however. Rayleigh picked up the classified volume. I did find something similar under classified. Luffy stood up and walked over to where Rayleigh was sitting to get a closer look at the book. Rayleigh started flipping through the pages again because he didn't bookmark what he found. What did the devil fruit that you ate look like, Luffy? He asked his student as he continued flipping through the pages. Ooh, let me think. Luffy put a finger to his forehead in hopes of trying to think harder to jog his memory. It was blue, violet, I think. It was round, like a ball. It had a stem on top, and it was covered in swirls. Oh, and it tasted really gross. The moment Luffy finished describing the fruit he ate, Rayleigh's page flipping came to a stop. What was revealed on one of the pages was an illustration of the very fruit that Luffy just described at the top of the right page. Yeah, that's the one. That's the fruit I ate. Luffy confirmed. He was starting to get excited about knowing more about his fruit. Look further down. Luffy did as he was told and looked at what else was written on the page. The first thing he noticed was the name under the picture. A name he was not familiar with. A name he didn't expect. Human Human Fruit. Model, Nika. Due to its unique nature, this devil fruit grants the user a baseline body with the properties of rubber, giving the user's body limitations and restrictions similar in nature to that of a common paramecia type. The fruit's true power as a mythical zoan type lies dormant until the user can successfully achieve an awakening. After awakening the fruit's true power, the user gains the abilities and appearance of the mythical sun god, Nik, granting their already rubbery body more strength, freedom, and creativity and turning the user into what is known as the Warrior of Liberation. According to the legend that was inscribed on the ancient texts, the Warrior of Liberation was once revered as the sun god by slaves from ancient times for bringing freedom and joy to those around them. Because of the nature of this legendary being, they are described as the most ridiculous power in the world. After reading that final paragraph out loud, Rayleigh closed the book with a hard slap. He and Luffy were taking their time processing all this new information that completely changed their view of Luffy's devil fruit. With this new info, we now know that your devil fruit powers come from a Zoan type, Rayleigh stated. Your body has already adapted to the belief that it's a Paramecia type, but we can fix that later. Luffy scratched the back of his head. Ooh, I'm a little confused. If I've had Zoan powers this whole time, how come I've never transformed like all the other Zoan type users I've seen? It's most likely because you ate a variety of the human-human fruit that makes it unnoticeable since you're already a human. To begin with, Vegapunk must have known that somehow, which is why he wrote it down in classified records. I can't tell whether he gave it to my crew by accident or on purpose. Rayleigh puts his books away before pulling out something else that jingled like a chain. Showing it to Luffy, it revealed a pair of Sea Prism Stone handcuffs. Sea Prism Stone is a rare and unique substance that radiates the same energy as the sea, which can neutralize and drain the abilities of Devil Fruit users. What are those for? Luffy asked, pointing to said handcuffs. They're Sea Prism Stone handcuffs, Rayleigh answered, we'll be wearing them while training. Why? After our little discovery, I'm gonna have to completely change your training regimen. The first step is for you to stop using your Devil Fruit powers. W-H-A-A-A-T. Luffy shouted, his eyes widened in shock. How's that supposed to help me get stronger? As it said in the book, the only way to unlock your devil fruit's true potential and, by extension, yours, is to awaken that dormant power. What the heck does that even mean? Rayleigh sighed. Here, I'll explain. So listen close. Awakening is the special stage in which devil fruit users unlock the true potential of their fruit's power, not only affecting themselves but their surroundings too. Understand. MMHM. MMHM. Luffy nodded. Good, you're catching on quickly. Rayleigh makes a swift motion with his hand. Suddenly, the sea prism stone handcuffs disappeared from his hand. Luffy suddenly felt weak. All his energy was quickly drained out of his body, causing him to slouch over the log he was sleeping against earlier. He moaned in exhaustion while noticing that the handcuffs that Rayleigh was just holding were now clamped around his wrists. Hey, uh, Luffy groaned weakly. What should do that for? This is gonna be your training. Our first priority is getting you to completely master your hacky before moving on to your devil fruit awakening. 
We'll be restricting the use of your devil fruit powers until you've mastered Haki, as well as helping you get used to the weakness of the sea prism stone. By the time you take those off, you'll have a high tolerance to its effects. How am I supposed to train my Haki when my hands are bound like this? Luffy was referring to the short chain that linked the cuffs together. Instead of getting a verbal answer, Rayleigh crouched next to Luffy before grabbing the chain with his left hand. See Prism Stone is as strong and durable as diamonds. But once you have completely mastered Haki, you'll be able to do this. Rayleigh's hand was suddenly clad in a shiny black coating, hardening, the most basic application of armament Haki. So far, Luffy had learned how to do that much. But what the rubber man didn't recognize was that Rayleigh's hardened hand was now emanating a green, flowing aura. Next thing he knew, the chain link was completely crushed under the old man's grip, pulling his hand back. The broken chain was now detached, leaving only the cuffs that were still around Luffy's wrists. Luffy may have been weakened, but he couldn't take his eyes off the amazing feat that his mentor had just demonstrated. That was so cool. What was that? Luffy asked cheerfully, despite the effects of the sea prison stone. That, Rayleigh began explaining as he deactivated his hacky. Dot 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 was a more advanced type of armament hacky, known as internal destruction. I learned it in the new world. I was able to emit my armament hacky, making it flow into my target's body and destroy it from the inside out on contact. This technique can deal devastating internal damage, bypassing any defense, no matter how strong or durable it is. Hey, wait a minute. Luffy interrupted. Is that what you did when you removed Kami's slave collar back at Sabayati? That's right, Rayleigh answered. I'm surprised you were able to put the pieces together. Looks like we found something you're interested in. Of course I'm interested. I have to get stronger so I can protect my friends. I'll do whatever it takes to become the strongest. Luffy sat up, eyes filled with the fires of determination. Rayleigh smiled proudly, knowing he found just the right motivation he needed to pull through his upcoming training regimen. Even more proud of the fact that Luffy was already resisting the effects of the sea prism stone without even noticing. He barely had them on for two minutes, which slightly scared the retired pirate. I admire your determination, Luffy. You've proven yourself to be a reliable leader to your crew. They must be proud of you. Luffy nodded with a smile. Rayleigh looks up at the moon through a gap in the jungle's thick canopy. The sun will be rising soon, so get some rest while you can. Tomorrow's training is gonna be even tougher. Right, night, old man. Luffy lays back down to make himself more comfortable. Oh, and Rayleigh. H.M. Thanks. The next morning, Luffy had a bit of trouble waking up since he slept with the sea prism stone handcuffs stuck to his wrist. Rayleigh neglected to mention to the boy sooner that he didn't have the key for them, or that they were the only pair of cuffs that he had on his person. But with a whack to the head from a hacky infused wooden club, Luffy was now wide awake and with a comical bump on his head. After getting ready, the teacher and student made their way to a clearing with enough space to not harm the island's ecosystem if Luffy ever got out of hand with any collateral damage. All right, Luffy, Rayleigh said, you've almost mastered the hardening stage of armament hacky, so you're gonna be sparring against me next. Since you can't use your devil fruit powers, you'll have to get used to moving around in that fragile body. This training is designed to help build up your muscles at a much faster rate than you ever had back when you were made of rubber. Be warned, though, this training will put you under a lot of stress and pain, but all your hardships will be rewarded with developing your observation hacky. So while we're sparring, I'm not gonna hold anything back, and I want you to do the same. Now, I know this may sound unfair since you're the one with the handicap, so I'll do my best not to kill you. Sounds good to me. Luffy didn't seem scared in the slightest. If anything, he actually looks more serious than ever. Good. Your first lesson will be to defend yourself from my attacks. But before that, Rayleigh walks behind Luffy and ties a blindfold around his eyes. You rely far too much on your vision, so we'll need to prevent you from doing that in the future. Huh? I can't see. Luffy struggles to get a good feel of his surroundings and starts waving his arms around, trying to get his bearings. Leave that on for a while and let yourself get used to it. Ooh, okay. Luffy takes a couple of slow steps forward before he quickly trips over a small rock in his path. Luckily, he stopped his descent by swiftly putting the other foot forward. Damn it, this is gonna be tough, Luffy complained, standing back up straight. How do you even sense rocks? This is training. Rayleigh reminded him, you have to use all of your senses, not just your eyesight. No matter how good your eyes may be, you'll never see everything. Enemies that can move at the speed of sound must be detected through other methods. Once you develop your observation hacky, you can intercept their attacks. After carefully processing Rayleigh's teachings, Luffy slams his fist into his palm, right? I'm ready, so let's do it. Luffy stands completely still, arms to the side, legs spread, and fists tighten. He focuses on the sound around him. The sound of the wind blowing through the trees, the birds chirping, and the cries of the distant animals. But his main focus is his sparring partner. There, bunk, O-W-W, G-R-R, everything hurts like hell. It's like I told you, pain is the most effective teacher when mastering hacky. 
After many hours of bone-breaking abuse and soul-crushing discipline at the hands of his merciless mentor, Luffy made little, yet noticeable, progress in today's training. Even after the countless bruises and bumps he suffered, Luffy didn't let up for even a second, nor did he ask Rayleigh to let him catch his breath. He almost couldn't believe how much endurance Luffy had, even when the added durability that came with his Zoan fruit had been restrained along with his powers. That fire in his eyes never went out. Today's training session seems to have turned up the heat. This development did not elude the attention of the Pirate King's first mate. After giving Luffy some first aid, the two were now sitting around a campfire, with Luffy eating a huge chunk of meat right off the bone like he hadn't eaten in days. Slow down, you're gonna choke yourself. Remember, your rubbery powers are disabled right now. Luffy didn't respond, and instead just kept on devouring the source of protein. Back when he was just a kid, Luffy used to eat when he was upset, a habit that won't end anytime soon. Before he could take another bite, Rayleigh asked his student a serious question. Luffy, you were behaving a little differently today. What changed? Luffy froze. He slowly puts his half-eaten carcass back on the spit, an act of manners that Rayleigh thought he would never see out of the rubber man. When I think about all I've been through, all the battles I've fought, there's only one thing that I've learned from all of that. Rayleigh waited patiently for an answer, which first came in the form of Luffy's flames of determination burning in his eyes. There's always someone stronger. The old man was slightly shocked at how much more mature Luffy was becoming. When the two first met at the human auctioning house at Sabayati Archipelago, Rayleigh's first impression of Luffy was mostly based around the straw hat he wore, reminiscing about the times when his former crewmate, Shanks, used to wear that exact same hat, but he neglected to see what was beneath that until he started training Luffy and getting to know him better. Now he was seeing Luffy in a whole new light, a light that was brought to life by the fire in Luffy's eyes. I made a vow to my brother a long time ago that I was going to get stronger than anybody, but in the end, he died because I wasn't strong enough to protect him. But no more, I've lost more than I could stand, and if I can't even protect my crew in their dreams, then how could I call myself their captain? I need this training, I can't afford any setbacks. No matter what I have to endure, I need to be the strongest before I meet up with my crew. Even stronger than Roger, I won't accept anything less. Rayleigh, full of pride for his students' newfound motivation, smiled. So, your strength comes from protecting your friends, is that it? Yeah. In that case, Rayleigh pointed two fingers in the direction of Luffy's glowing eyes. Keep that fire burning in your eyes. Never let it snuff out. Keep your friends close to your heart at all times. Let those images fuel your flame and keep rising higher, Luffy. Luffy felt more determined than ever after that. The thought of his friends and the memories they made together was washing over his mind like a maelstrom. You're thinking about them right now, aren't you? Rayleigh asked as if it was obvious. Uh-huh, Luffy answered, I just wonder what everyone's up to. You still have something left in this world to treasure, don't you? The encouraging words of Jimbei echoed in his thoughts. I still have my crew, Luffy whispered to himself, Zoro. Luffy's first mate and swordsman of the Straw Hat Pirates, a muscular man of average height in his late teens with lightly tanned skin and moss green hair. He always carried around three swords for the sake of his three-sword style. Before joining Luffy's crew, he was a renowned and feared bounty hunter who was known throughout the East Blue for his expertise in hunting down wanted pirates, thus earning him the name Pirate Hunter Roranoa Zoro. While I'm with you, the only thing I dedicate myself to is fulfilling my ambition to be nothing less than the world's greatest swordsman. I solemnly swear, from this moment forward, that I will never lose again. Until the day comes, when I defeat him and take his title, I will never, never be defeated. Is that okay? King of the Pirates, use up. The crew sniper in Resident Liar. A slim tan-skinned teenager with medium-length black curly hair and a very long nose. Yuzop was known cowardly fella, known for his constant lies and tall tales that he enjoys telling to both friends and strangers alike. Despite his disposition, he strives to become a great pirate as well as better himself, working hard to keep his crew safe and help them accomplish their dreams as well as his own. Luffy welcomed him aboard his newly acquired ship, the Going Merry, after helping him save his village from the devious Captain Kuro of a Thousand Plans and his crew, the Black Cat Pirates. Yuzop, I am, I am the captain of the Yuzop Pirates, a brave warrior of the sea. And mark my words, you will never set foot in that village. Get on already. Huh, we're friends, right? So, get on. Bye. I'm really a pirate captain now. Don't be stupid, Yuzop. I quote him the captain. Mami, the navigator and self-imposed treasurer of the Straw Hat Pirates, a slim young woman of average height with short orange hair. If Luffy weren't so oblivious to womanly charm, he would consider her to be very attractive. She has a blue tattoo on her left shoulder, which represented tangerines and pinwheels, a reminder of her hometown. Before joining the crew, Nami was a thief who specialized in robbing pirates of their treasure. Luffy, help me, he's gonna pay. Luffy, N-A-M-I, you'll always be my friend. 
Yeah, Sanji, a highly skilled cook and womanizer. He's a slim, muscular, long-legged man with blonde hair which he keeps brushed over to one side of his face. Sanji's most distinctive feature is his spiral-shaped eyebrows. Luffy met Sanji at the Floating Sea Restaurant, Barady, where Sanji worked as the sous chef. The owner and head chef, Zeph, was a former pirate who sacrificed his left leg to save Sanji from starvation when they were both marooned on a rock outcropping. High above sea level, Sanji takes great pride in his culinary skills, resorting to using only his legs to fight, for he cannot risk any harm to come to his hands, a cook's most sacred tool. Say, have you ever heard of the All Blue? Your dream is foolish. Then again, so is mine. Now's as good a time as any. Why not start my quest now? I'll be joining your little crew. On your journey to be king of the pirates. You hear me? I want to be the cook on your ship. Chef Zeph. Thanks, you geezer. I'll never forget your kindness. I owe my life to you, old man. So, thank you. Dot 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 and Chopper, too. The ship's doctor. Chopper is a toddler-sized human. Reindeer hybrid with a blue nose who ate the human-human fruit. A Zoan-type devil fruit, granting him the ability to talk and walk upright like a human. He was trained in the art of medicine by his parental figure, Dr. Kira. He used to be extremely timid towards unfamiliar humans before he met Luffy, with whom he later found out had a lot in common. Luffy accepted Chopper for who he was and convinced him to become a pirate with him. Even if I don't have friends, I can still fight for something I believe in. You do have friends. I'm your friend, Reindeer. Me. Okay, maybe I do want to be a pirate, but I can never be one of you. I'm not human. I'm a monster. Shut up. Let's go. Robin, the archaeologist of the Straw Hat Pirates, and user of the Flower Flower Fruit, a Paramecia-type devil fruit, granting her the power to willing reproduce any parts of her body on any surface. She's a tall, slender young woman with shoulder-length black hair. Having nowhere else to go after the Straw Hat stopped a civil war in the desert kingdom of Alabasta, she held Luffy responsible for saving her life when she had given up on it. She temporarily left the crew after being captured by the world government covert assassins, CP9 at Water 7, and escorted to the judicial island, Anai's lobby, where she suffered continuous torture at the hands of Spandam, CP9's chief. She was soon rescued by her crewmates after Luffy encouraged her to keep on living, despite the fear she had of losing those she cared about to her enemies. There's no place for me to go or return to, so I've decided that I'll join you. WHAAAT. Those pirates, just declared war against the world government. Robin, there's still something I wanna hear you say. Tell me you want to live. I want to live. Take me with you. Take me away from here. Dot 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 and Frankie. The shipwright of the Straw Hat Pirates, creator of the crew's current ship, the Thousand Sunny, and former ship dismantler and face of Water 7's underworld. Frankie of a self-modified cyborg at a height of at least 7 feet. His forearms were massively enormous with star tattoos on them while his biceps were comparably small and a full-toned chest. He has bright blue hair and a prosthetic iron nose. Frankie used to run a gang of ship dismantlers and bounty hunters called the Frankie family, named after their founder and leader until he stole BH. 200 million from the Straw Hat Pirates. He later kidnapped Usopp and the severely damaged Going Mary. After Luffy's crew retaliated against the Frankie family while the boss himself went shopping on the black market with their stolen money. After getting tangled up in the same situation that got Robin captured, he was also taken to Impel Down to be interrogated by Spandam on the whereabouts of the blueprints for the ancient weapon Plute, which Frankie inherited from his old shipbuilding master, Tom. Frankie burnt the blueprints so that the ancient weapon could never be built, while fighting through and escaping an eyes lobby with the Straw Hat Pirates. They eventually patched things up until Luffy eventually invited him to join his crew after building the Thousand Sunny. If you want your undies back, then you're gonna have to join my crew. You got the finest vessel on the sea and no shipwright. What can I say? You don't leave me much choice. I gotta take care of my masterpiece, after all. So, set sail. I'm joining the crew. I'm gonna super miss you all. Dot 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 and Brooke. The musician of the Straw Hat Pirates, and former member of the Rumbar Pirates. An extremely tall reanimated skeleton with a large black afro with strong roots that was brought back to life after dying. Thanks to the powers of the Revive Revive Fruit, a paramecia-type devil fruit, which grants the user a second chance at life. Brooke once sailed the seas with a pirate crew of musicians until they were annihilated by another stronger pirate crew. Unable to steer the ship, Brooke's soul found itself lost in the thick fog of the Florian Triangle. By the time he reunited with his body again, all that was left was a well-dressed skeleton. But he was still able to get a second chance at life to fulfill a promise he and his crew made to an island whale named Laboon, whom they told to wait for them at the entrance to the Grand Line. Determined to stay true to that promise, he accepts Luffy's invitation to join the Straw Hats in hopes of seeing Laboon again. I'm glad to hear that Laboon is well and still waiting for me. My shadow has returned, and we're leaving the Devil's Sea. Every day on that boat was difficult. Frankly, I had given up all hope. 
But, Luffy, you know what? I'm just so happy to still be Ollie Hi 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 Hive. Suo, does the offer to join your crew still stand? Yeah, welcome aboard. W-H-A-A-A-T. Divided by for real. Divided by no W-A-A-A-Y. Luffy cares about his crew more than anything. And he knew they felt the same way about him. They were now his sole reason for getting stronger. His crewmates are much more than just his friends. They were also his source of strength. His lifeline. He thought he lost them for good after they got into a fight with Bartholomew Kuma, one of the seven warlords of the seas. They were hopelessly overpowered by the enigmatic titan, who then went on to separate the straw hat pirates individually with the powers of his pawpaw fruit, a strange paramecia-type devil fruit which gives the user paw-shaped pads on their palms that can repel anything they touch with tremendous force and distance. Kuma sent Luffy's friends flying to unknown corners of the world, himself included, since he was able to land safely on Amazon Lily. He assumed the rest of his crew were still alive. Not knowing their whereabouts, Luffy sent out a secret message that only his crew could decipher in the local newspaper. Their original plan on the Sabayati Archipelago was to wait three days for Rayleigh to finish coding their ship, making it worthy to travel safely underwater to get to Fishman Island, their last destination before going to the New World. With the whole crew separated the world over, it would have been impossible to meet back up at Sabayati in just three days. So Luffy decided to give his friends two years to hone their skills and increase their chances of survival in the new world. Thus, Luffy purposely went back to the war-scarred island of Marineford to get his photo taken, as well as pay his respects to Ace's grave. The photo that was published showed Luffy with his eyes closed and holding his straw hat up to his chest after throwing a bouquet of flowers into the rubble, bowing his head in silent prayer. He successfully got his message across with a tattoo on his right arm, which showed the initials 3D2Y, with the 3D crossed out. The message translated to see you at Sabayati in two years. Being able to read Luffy like a book throughout the time they've known each other, Rayleigh easily predicts what his student was thinking right now. That's why, I have to get stronger, so I can protect my friends, so I can fight to make their dreams come true, just like they do for me. Who knows, maybe your friends are thinking the exact same thing. Perhaps they all want to get stronger, just like you. Yeah, Luffy sighed, finally feeling satisfied with his current mindset. With his goals now on a straight path, he was prepared for what was to come during the remaining 21 months of training. No matter what challenges await him, Monkey D. Luffy will rise above it all. Which of the government dog's lives closest to here? Let's meet him. Another brutal day of hacky training goes by for the legendary pirate in training. Come nightfall, Luffy was in the middle of devouring another huge chunk of meat off the bone. With the restriction of his baseline rubbery body, Luffy had been eating less food than he normally does. Dot 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 at least 5% less. After quickly getting used to wearing sea prism stone handcuffs for the last couple of days, Luffy no longer felt like he was being drained of energy, although he still can't stretch. This intensified his training to new bounds. Today, he attempted to improve his armament, hardening by fighting the colossal animals of Lascana. He could no longer afford to keep taking hits from the beast since his devil fruit powers had been cancelled out, so he was forced to resort to constant dodging, something he was not the best at. But Rayleigh told him it was the perfect excuse to train his observation hacky by predicting where, and, eventually, when the attacks would strike. Luffy's first opponent was a massive blue gorilla the size of a house. Following Rayleigh's instructions, Luffy prioritized speed over strength and let the opponent make the first move. Luffy's speed was growing by leaps and bounds. Before the revision to his new training regiment, Luffy demonstrated second gear to his mentor, explaining how it made him move at mind-boggling speeds. Rayleigh later identified this speed feat as Shave, one of the six powers. The six powers is a special, superhuman martial art style that is mostly used by agents of the world government. Anyone who could master the six powers is said to have the strength of a hundred men. Shave allows the user to move at extremely high speeds, making them seem like they disappeared. This technique is mostly used for avoiding attacks, as well as to attack at higher speeds, which can generate greater power. The first time Luffy witnessed Shave was when it was used by Bluno, a member of CP9, back at Anai's lobby. After carefully observing how his opponent moved with the technique, it was revealed that the principle of executing it properly was to kick off the ground at least ten times in the brink of an eye. Unable to pull it off in his base form, Luffy utilized his second gear by pumping up his metabolism and allowing him to move at disappearing speeds, which surpassed Blue Nose. After explaining how second gear works, Rayleigh decided to make the technique redundant. Consecutive use of second gear was really dangerous and taxing to Luffy's body. His increased blood flow gave his body more oxygen and nutrients, which is what makes him move a lot faster. Since his blood vessels and organs were made of rubber, he was able to handle it, but he never noticed the price that came with it. The more Luffy used second gear, the more oxygen and energy he ends up burning through, which can be quite straining on the body. 
In his second gear form, Luffy's body glows a light shade of red, and steam starts billowing from his body like a steam train. The steam is the result of his entire metabolism rate going up so high that his sweat evaporates. So Rayleigh decides to teach Luffy how to use the six powers in place of second gear, which will benefit Luffy in the long run. This was one of the reasons Rayleigh had Luffy get used to the feel of Sea Prism Stone, to overcome hypothetical situations where his enemies try to restrain his powers, but still, give him the strength to fight back. After all, the sea only cursed devil fruit users while Haki and the six powers can still be used. Unfortunately, Rayleigh didn't know very much about the six powers, except for only knowing how to use Shave and Finger Pistol. Finger Pistol is a close-range combat technique that allows the user to push their finger into their target at a very high speed leaving a wound similar to a bullet hole. This technique is more deadly than most bullets, as it is sharp and agile enough to penetrate even iron-hard defenses. Rayleigh decided to hold off on this form of training until after Luffy completely mastered hacking. He had planned on teaching Luffy how to combine finger pistol with the long-range capabilities of his stretchy powers. Luffy had a rocky start when fighting the blue gorilla, along with some other animals later on, for he also had to wear the blindfold again to train his observation hacky, making things a whole lot more difficult. But that's exactly what Luffy wanted. No matter how many times Luffy slipped up, he always got right back up. After the vexing day he had, Luffy was currently venting his frustrations out on his dinner while recalling the events that occurred. He was able to deflect and intercept most of the attacks from the large animals, while at other times he got away with a few scrapes and cuts. After fighting the blue gorilla, Luffy ended up having to avoid the jaws of a massive alligator to the crushing paws of a titanic lion. Luckily, his teacher was there to step in if things ever got out of hand. Damn, Luffy complained through a mouthful of meat. I swear, all the animals are ganging up on me. He swallows before taking another bite. I'll get him back as soon as I'm done eating. You think that's wise? Rayleigh asked, with a mug in his hand. Going back for round two before giving your body time to recover. Yeah, I'm tired of getting beat by those 3,000. Luffy gagged as choked on his dinner. Dropping the half-eaten bone, he pumps his chest to help swallow what was stuck in his throat until he finally managed to make the food go the right way. Luffy let out a relieving sigh. Rayleigh let out a disappointed sigh. Keep that up, and it won't be the training that kills you. Your body's not used to eating as much as you're used to yet, so don't talk while eating, the old man asked, enjoying his drink. Got it, Luffy said, feeling a little embarrassed. Luffy then finishes the rest of his meal this time at a more moderate speed, then chugs down the rest of his drink. He then immediately picks up his blindfold and ties it back on before standing up and marching off toward the dark jungle. Later, I see. Try not to die, his teacher casually said with a smirk. Right, Luffy responded, punching the air above him while continuing on his way. Keeping his senses on high alert at all times, Luffy made his way through the dark jungle, which isn't saying much for a man with a blindfold on. After trekking through for a while, it would seem that the animals have decided to call it quits for the day since he hasn't been able to pick up any trace of their presence. Huh, where did all of them run off to? They didn't go to sleep, did they? Luffy asked in annoyance. Hey, Mr. Gorilla, Mr. Alligator, Mr. Lion, I'm ready. Come out and fight me. Stopping in his tracks, Luffy sniffed around. Hey, what's that? Catching a whiff of something, his mouth began to water. Whatever it is, it smells really tasty. Luffy muttered, following his nose, where's it coming from? He then walks off to do a little private investigating of the scent. Suddenly, his train of thought had shifted. Hold on a sec. Luffy stopped, realizing that something wasn't right. Since he just ate, he was no longer hungry enough to fall for the tempting aroma of delicious food. Whatever it was that allured his nose, it smells a hell of a lot better than meat cooked over a fire. There are traces of spices and seasonings mixed in as well. Wiping the drool from his mouth, Luffy steeled himself, reminding himself that he and Rayleigh were the only two humans on the island. So why would there be the smell of cooking here? The animals he had been fighting on Luskana always behaved like wild and destructive beasts, clearly incapable of something as advanced as cooking. It could only mean one thing. Someone else is on this island, Luffy muttered cautiously. Not far from where the smell of food was coming from, a group of women are hiding in the dense foliage at the edge of the jungle, looking out into the ocean of the calm belt. They were all dressed in provocative warrior-style clothing, such as bikini-like straps to cover their breasts, very short loin clothes on their lower regions, and thigh-length boots with stockings on their legs. Some were even wearing long capes from shoulder to ankles. These were but a few members of the Kuja, a tribe of all female warriors and residents of Amazon Lily. Each warrior carries a large snake wrapped around them, which the Kuja use as a bow. Amazon Lily and the Kuja pirates were ruled by the three Gorgon sisters, with the eldest, Boa Hancock, as their ruler and captain. She is known as the Pirate Empress, for her status as one of the seven warlords of the sea. She is considered the most beautiful woman in the world. 
Among those that were hiding in the foliage is the middle sister of the Gorgon sisters, Boa Sandersonia. She is a large woman who resembles a snake. Due to her long forked tongue sticking out of her mouth, she has a curvaceous figure and large breasts. Her head, while disproportionately large and wide to her body, is topped with long green hair. Unlike her subordinates, she does not have a snake to use as a weapon. Second was her younger sister, Boa Marigold, a large, bulky woman with a build similar to that of a sumo wrestler with large breasts to go with it. Her orange hair is arranged in a way to make it look like the pattern on a cobra's hood. Below the two Gorgon sisters were three of their subjects. The first, and tallest, was a Felindra, an extremely tall woman with childlike facial features. She has long orange-brown hair, falling past her shoulders, with a plumed Morian-type helmet with cheek guards on her head. She carries a sheathed sword horizontally over her lower back. Next to her is Sweet Pea, a very large, corpulent woman with a masculine-like build with brown pigtails. She's one of the many Kuja warriors who carry a snake as a weapon. And finally, there's Margaret, a young Kuja lady who is quite tall for her age. She has short, unruly blonde hair, long slender legs, and a slim, curvaceous figure. Compared to the other women present, Margaret's the most normal-looking one. She keeps her snake wrapped around her waist. The group of women was sent to Laskana at the request of their leader, Boa Hancock, to deliver some supplies to Luffy, which mostly consisted of freshly cooked food. He didn't want to accept the food, since it would just spoil him, but the pirate empress couldn't help herself. After sorting out a misunderstanding when Luffy was sent to Amazon Lily by Bartholomew Kuma, he gained the trust of the Gorgon sisters for protecting a traumatizing secret that they hid from the rest of their subjects. Luffy understood the story behind their dark secret and declared that he despises the ones responsible for the sisters' suffering. As a result, Hancock fell helplessly in love with Luffy as well as pledged her loyalty to him. The young man was oblivious to her affections and never returned them in kind, but that didn't stop the pirate empress from trying to win over his heart. She was worried that Luffy wasn't getting enough to sustain his health, so she sent her crew to deliver food for him discreetly, despite the promise she made to Rayleigh not to interfere with Luffy's training by pampering him. A buffet was laid out on a small plateau overlooking the sea. Nearby, the Kuja pirates are hiding in the darkness of the trees, waiting patiently for Luffy to arrive so they could observe him and report his condition and status to Hancock. While they waited for their mutual friend to arrive, Sandersonia was holding an active transponder snail, a species of telepathic snail that is used for vocal and or visual communication throughout the world. Connected on the other side of the snail was Boa Hancock's voice. Well, is he there yet? Hancock asks worriedly, her voice coming out of the snail's mouth. Not yet, Sandersonia answered. We're still waiting for him. Ooh, I hope she shows up soon. I don't want the food getting cold. Hancock whined. Don't worry, sister. There's no way Luffy can resist the smell of gourmet cooking. Marigold reassured her sister, he'll show up. Oh, I hope so. The longer we wait, the more likely you'll be discovered by Rayleigh instead. Despite his suspicion that an intruder could be nearby, the overwhelming aroma of the scent that Luffy was following was too much to resist. His nose eventually led him close enough to the source that he began drooling again. That, Luffy sniffed, smells like food. Okay, I gotta see. He excitedly rips off his blindfold to behold a large spread of food set up on a low table. Uh, I knew it. Luffy exclaims before running to the buffet, but quickly slowed down, is all this stuff for me? Who could have? Luffy stopped to inspect what was laid out in front of him. The most noticeable dish he recognized was a large pot of pengorgonzola with sea king meat, a dish that Luffy fondly remembered eating back on Amazon Lily. Not those guys again. Hancock. Luffy groaned, finally realizing without a doubt who the intruders he was sensing were. I appreciate what they're doing, but I'm not hungry at the moment, he complained to no one in particular. Closing his eyes, he focused his observation hacky to locate the auras of anyone he was familiar with. It didn't take long for him to feel the presence of five figures hiding nearby. Found him, he thought, turning his head towards the jungle. He casually matches towards the spot where he sensed the group, when he sensed someone else, someone unfamiliar, someone hostile. His concerns were realized when three people, Margaret, Sweet Pea, and Ephelindra, were suddenly flung out of the dark foliage and slid painfully across the overlook until they were right next to Luffy, who was shocked at the state they were in. Girls, Luffy called out, are you okay? Luffy, run away. Margaret cried out fearfully to him. Run from what? Luffy asked worriedly crouching down to examine their beaten forms. Who did this to you? Before he could get an answer, he heard and felt the sound of heavy footsteps as he looked up. Emerging from the trees was a very tall and broad man with thick arms and thin legs. He had a beard and a W-shaped mustache, both a different shade of green. He wore a horned helmet with the left horn broken off, an open black and purple sleeveless coat revealing his chest green pants, a brown belt, and brown shoes. Under his coat, he had a thick iron chain from his left shoulder to his right hip. 
Sitting on his left shoulder was a short and scrawny old man with a long white beard and mustache. He wore a green coat and a short horned helmet with the right horn missing, similar to the larger man. He was carrying what appeared to be a portable support pole holding an IV drip that was injected into his right arm. Standing back up straight, Luffy leered at the newcomers, for he noticed that the larger man was carrying Sandersonia and Marigold's unconscious bodies underneath each of his arms. Hey, you! Luffy shouted, eyes full of rage. What did you do to my friends? Biajack, who's he? The larger man asked, raising an eyebrow at Luffy in annoyance. Before getting ambushed by the unknown intruder, Margaret and the girls were carefully waiting for Luffy to appear. He finally showed up, wearing only his sandals, shorts, and a blindfold. Taking off the blindfold and noticing the food they laid out for him, the girls began to giggle in excitement. Luffy has found the food. Sandersonia whispered into the transponder snail, Yeah, it's him all right. Hawa. Hancock moaned in delight from the other side of the connection, as if she was about to faint, Luffy's there. But when the girls noticed that he didn't start stuffing his face right away, they got a little concerned thinking something didn't seem right. Luffy usually has such a big appetite. A Felindra said worriedly, I wonder what's wrong. Why? I don't think he even noticed the frilly spring outfits we made for him, Sweet Pea added. Hmm. Margaret frowned. What's going on? Hancock asked, did he like it? Something's wrong, sis. Luffy's not eating. He's just standing there, glaring at the food, Sandersonia answered. Maybe he's not hungry, asked Marigold. I'm looking for the Empress, said a deep voice from behind, the leader of Amazon Lily. The Kuja pirates turned around, gasping at the sudden presence. With a wicked grin, the large, helmet-wearing man backhanded Sandersonia, causing her to slide roughly across the dirt and drop her transponder snail. Who are you? Marigold demanded, holding her giant polearm in both hands, while the rest of the female warriors readied their own weapons. State your business, since you asked. The name's Biondi World. The large man answered, uncaringly, I'm here to kidnap the government's dog, Boa Hancock. You heard of her? Marigold gasped, shocked by what she heard. You wish to kidnap the princess? Asked Margaret, pulling back an arrow with her snake bow and taking aim at World. She is not here, but we shall face you ourselves, declared Sweet Pea, readying her weapon the same way as Margaret. World flinched. Ah, uh, what? He said, glaring at the small, elderly man, Biajack, sitting on his shoulder. I, uh, Biajack started with a raspy voice. I didn't make any promises, right? I just saw the Kuja ship on the shore and thought she might be here. We just got unlucky this time. No big deal, the old man finished before taking a few sickly coughs into his hand. What a waste of my time, World said disappointingly before turning around and walking away. Hold it, demanded Marigold, causing World to stop. You can't come here to kidnap my sister and then walk away. Marigold's body then starts transforming. She grew larger with scales appearing all over her body. Her legs were replaced with a long tail, and her face grew more snake-like. A power granted to her by the Zoan-type devil fruit, Snake Snake Fruit, model, King Cobra. If you want to fight, then you shall find one at the end of my blade. World slowly turned around and looked at her with mild curiosity. You're her sister. Hey, Sonya. Mary. Someone tell me what's going on right now. Hancock's voice demanded. Do you hear me? Please, say something. Balalalo. World laughed, looking down at the snail lying on its side on the ground. I see, the Empress is on the other side of that snail. In that case, World suddenly dashed towards Marigold. He drove his hacky-coated fist at Marigold, who stopped the punch with the blade of her polearm. The sudden movement kicked up a cloud of dust between the two. More more tenfold shotgun. World chanted, blowing some air at the dust, causing it to launch at Marigold's face like bullets. Marigold cried out in pain as the attack knocked her to the ground. You keep your hands off her, or else, shouted Margaret as she and Sweet Pea unleashed their arrows at the man who attacked the royal sisters. World easily evaded the arrows with blinding speed. Down along low, he laughed before pulling his fist back and charging at the three warriors. I have no business with the rest of you, said World, giving the group a threatening look, dot 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 so time to die. Fat chance, you bastard. Luffy lost it and charged straight at the menacing man. He coated his fist with Armemnet Hacky and slugged World right across the face, to which he didn't even flinch. At the last moment, before Luffy's fist made contact, World coated his entire head in Armament Hacky, making it feel like he had punched a solid wall. Hey, kiddo, World said casually, glaring at him, dot 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 what are you doing? Before Luffy could pull back, World swung his leg around and kicked Luffy in the gut, sending him flying and crashing into a large stone outcrop. The impact was strong enough to leave Luffy's broken body imprinted in the solid stone, stuck as he tried his best to struggle out and recover. But World didn't give him that luxury. He dropped Sandersonia like a hunted game before picking up a small rock off the ground. Say goodbye. He casually tosses it up and down in his hand before shouting out, more more hundredfold gun, and threw the rock right at Luffy. 
That won't work, he started, but he briefly forgot that he was no longer made of rubber. And before he could react, the rock suddenly grew a hundred times its original size, becoming a huge boulder, and was coated in armament hacky. The hardened boulder slammed into Luffy, causing him to scream in pain before blacking out. Get over here, I think Luffy's awake. Luffy heard a voice as he was starting to regain consciousness. He knew the voice had to belong to Rayleigh since he recognized his face as he struggled to open his eyes. However, Luffy blacked out once again, only briefly. After another minute had passed, he opened his eyes again, his vision now much more clear. It was now the break of dawn, and he spotted three more familiar faces, looking down anxiously at him. Hancock, Luffy said weakly, what are you doing here? You finally woke up, Hancock said, relieved that the man she loves is finally awake. What a relief. Boa Hancock is considered the most beautiful woman in the world. She has a well-proportioned figure compared to her abnormally sized sisters. She is tall and slender with long black hair that extends past her waist with locks that frame her face. Showing off her forehead, she has dark brown eyes with long voluptuous eyelashes and pale skin. With a narrow waist and very large breasts, Hancock wore a purple dress with gold trim and a great light purple image of her Jolly Roger at the bottom. Black heels on her feet and large, gold snake-shaped earrings hanging from both her ears. Behind Hancock was her snake weapon, Salome. Salome is a large, white female snake with big pink spots running down her whole body, while the underside was a pale yellow, with thin black lines across it. Her head was topped with a cracked, horned skull with blue hair jutting out from the back, like a lion's mane. She also wore a purple scarf tied around her neck. The last familiar face was Gloriosa, more commonly referred to as Elder Nyon, a short, wrinkly old woman with very thick lips and white hair with a pink flower on the left side of her head. She wore a sort of green bubble belt, meant to hold up her short spotted skirt, as well as a cape around her shoulders. Her purple snake weapon acted like a staff, with the upper body curled up. Luffy grimaced in pain as he struggles to push himself up into a sitting position. Don't try to get up, Rayleigh said, you still haven't fully recovered yet. Ignoring his teacher, Luffy jolted his head around and shouted, Oh, yeah, what happened to the girls? They were treated for their wounds and now they're sleeping, Gloriosa answered calmly, before lowering her head in grief, as for Sonya and Mary. That bastard kidnapped them, didn't he? Luffy asked, already knowing the answer. Yes, yes, Gloriosa nodded. Luffy was furious at that fact, damn it. What the hell was that guy's deal, anyway? Hancock stood tall before answering. From the sound of it, he wanted something from me because I'm one of the warlords. Are you going to rescue your sisters? Rayleigh asked. Of course, Hancock said firmly, thinking how that was even a real question. Princess, Gloriosa interjected. If he really is the notorious Biondi world, then even you're too weak to challenge him. Hancock, take me with you. Luffy interrupted, startling his elders. If we fight him together, there's no way I'll lose to him. Hancock gasps in shock. Normally, she wouldn't expect her love interest to be so insistent. Luffy, hold on, Rayleigh spoke up. The reason that we upped your training here is because you're not strong enough to fight opponents like him. I haven't given up on that. You are improving a lot faster, but you still have a long way to go before you can completely master Haki. And without your devil fruit powers, you'll be killed. I'm not gonna lose to him twice. Luffy shouted. Luffy, think about it. Rayleigh shouted back. What have you been training yourself for all this time? If you leave now, you might never see your friends again. But, Luffy frowned, feeling like Rayleigh was using his friends as an excuse to stay put. He raises his right fist and gently presses it against his chest. Taking a moment to remind himself why he took his training more seriously than before, Hancock and the others are my friends too. If I just abandon them when they're in trouble, and I could have done something to help them, then I'd be turning my back on the vow that I made to Ace and my friends. Luffy tightened his right fist, unaware that it was now coated in armament hacky. Luffy then shouted, so how can you expect me to just sit here and do nothing while the people I care about are in danger? Oh, Luffy, Hancock murmured, before turning her attention to the old man. Rayleigh, I promise I'll keep him safe. With him at my side, we'll finish this quickly. Rayleigh looked rather annoyed at her insistence but sighed tiredly. It doesn't matter what I say, Rayleigh said, I'm not going to change your mind. This got a smile out of both Luffy and Hancock. Rayleigh then stands back up on his feet. That's why I'm coming with you, huh? After a couple of hours of resuscitating. After Luffy's swift defeat at the hands of Biondi World, he, Rayleigh, Hancock, and the rest of the Kuja pirates were currently sailing the sea on the Kuja's flagship, the Perfume Yuta, a galleon with a pink, mansion-like structure in the middle, and paddle wheels installed on the stern in place of a rudder. Instead of a figurehead on the bow, the ship has a pair of Yuta, a breed of ferocious and highly poisonous sea serpents, tied to the front, where they steer the vessel. The front sail bears the Jolly Roger of the Kuja Pirates. This ship was specially designed to sail safely through the calm belt. 
The Calm Belt is an ocean that borders the north and south of the Grand Line, which acts as the breeding grounds of sea kings, colossal sea creatures that can grow to the size of islands, which makes them the biggest obstacle. This stretch of ocean acts as the most effective barrier for those who try to enter the Grand Line directly, because, for reasons unknown, there is never any wind or any ocean currents in the Calm Belt. It acts like a void where everything is stagnant, making it impossible for sailboats to travel through. Islands, such as Amazon Lily, and its neighbor Lascana are located in the Calm Belt. Thanks to the Kuja's close relationship with snakes, these brave warriors were more than capable of taming Yuta to pull their vessel, protecting them from sea kings that could easily swallow their ship whole, as well as traversing the Calm Belt safely. On the deck of the ship, Luffy was leaning the guard rails, staring out into the ocean. In addition to Luffy's previous apparel, he was now wearing a red, sleeveless jacket, given to him by the Kuja with the hood up to conceal his head, at Rayleigh's request, the latter doing the same with his hood. Speaking of the old man, who approached Luffy from behind, cleared his throat, gaining his student's attention. Luffy, since there's a good chance that you'll be going up against this world character soon, I'm willing to remove those restraints for you, so you can fight at your best, Rayleigh said, pointing to Luffy's sea prism stone handcuff. Luffy took a moment to contemplate his restraints. If he took them off, he could use his devil fruit powers to fight at his best. But, on the other hand, they don't have any space cuffs. If he decided to remove them, Rayleigh would have to break them off with his internal destruction, rendering them useless afterward, and they don't have the key or any spare cuffs. The Kuja, while a strong and proud people, were too isolated in the calm belt to have any knowledge of sea prism stone or devil fruits, so they were unable to accommodate a spare set of cuffs. With a smirk, Luffy shook his head and answered, I'll leave him on. I'll just think of this as part of my training. Besides, I never go back on my word. I'm not taking these off until I can do it by myself. Rayleigh smiled and put a hand on his student's shoulder from behind, expressing how proud of Luffy he was for continuing to raise the bars high. The reason Rayleigh decided to accompany Luffy with Hancock was to supervise his student's training in a practical setting while making sure he was there to prevent Luffy from getting himself killed since he already had so much riding on Luffy. He refused to intervene in any of the fights that Luffy may encounter during this rescue mission. He also had a personal reason for going but chose to keep it to himself. If that's what you want to do, I won't stop you. But it will make things a lot harder, Rayleigh warned. That's the whole point, right? Luffy asked rhetorically. Rayleigh smiled as he got a glimpse of the fire he came to admire so much, blazing majestically in his protege's eyes. Luffy, Rayleigh, a raspy voice interrupted from behind. The teacher and student turned around to be greeted by Gloriosa. Who continued, come with me, I need to inform you both about our enemy, she said before walking back the way she came, towards Hancock and the rest of the Kuja pirates. Hancock's glance was currently fixated on a small piece of paper in her hand, a Vivre card, IND World's Vivre card. These cards can also act as a guide for those who want to find the owner of the card. When placed on a flat surface, the paper will slowly shift in the direction of its owner. Vivre cards are only made in a certain place in the New World. As to how Hancock was able to acquire it, the boulder that had just been thrown at Luffy had just been broken in half after World's Armament Hacky had faded from it, with Luffy's unconscious body falling face flat into the dirt. Luffy, Hancock's voice sounded from the transponder snail, which was now in Biajack's feeble hand. So, is this the Empress of Amazon Lily? Biandy World spoke into the snail. Where's Luffy? Tell me you didn't hurt him. Hancock demanded angrily. Hem, World looked a little confused at that name. Biajack spoke up. I assume she's talking about that boy. World looked at Luffy's down form before looking back at the snail and chuckling. Balalalo, come here and see for yourself. I'll leave my Viva card next to the punk. As for you, Pirate Empress, if you ever want to see your sisters again, track me down in two days, before the break of dawn. Good luck. Balalalo. Wait, no, gotcha. The snail immediately went to sleep after World hung up, who then picked Sandersonia back up and dragged both her and Marigold away through the dark jungle. World, Biajack muttered, I've heard that name from somewhere before. Luffy, World simply stayed silent and continued walking away. Back on the deck of the perfume Yuta, Gloriosa was in the middle of telling the group about the man who had kidnapped Hancock's sisters. She had just finished explaining the madman's powers, after Luffy asked, being on the receiving end of it. Luffy recently started learning from Rayleigh that information is power, something which he now had in common with one of his crewmates, Nico Robin. World had gotten his powers from eating the Mormor fruit, a paramecia-type devil fruit, which allows the user to amplify the size, speed, and strength of any object they touch, including themselves. World's reputation was mostly based on his use of his devil fruit powers, mainly targeting islands and other ships, which he destroys with a single shot from his power-amplified cannonballs. This, in turn, earned him the nickname, Destroyer of the World. 
Luffy asked Gloriosa, his hands in the pockets of his borrowed jacket. The elder nodded, that's what they called him. World has a reputation for taking out anything that crosses his path. He was as much a threat to other pirates as he was to normal civilians. It didn't matter who you were. Luffy frowned. Pirates who destroy and ruin other people's lives are the kind he hated the most. Thirty years ago, the government decided to secretly assemble his enemies and others who held grudges against him. They joined the navy and executed a plan to take down World once and for all. Ultimately, World and his allies were defeated. If it was such a decisive victory, why on earth is he causing trouble again all of a sudden? Hancock asked. I have no idea, Gloriosa answered. I heard a rumor that he had been locked up and impelled down, in a frozen state of constant slumber. Perhaps, he was awakened somehow. At the mention of impelled down, Luffy was suddenly having troubling thoughts. After he had snuck into the underwater prison to try and save Ace, with Hancock's help, he managed to make it to the lowest level of the prison, level 6 Eternal Hell, where the world government keep their most powerful, dangerous, and irredeemable prisoners. Their crimes are so atrocious that their mere existence is considered a major threat and are given either a life sentence or the death penalty. They were basically erased from history. Shortly after stirring up trouble in the prison, and causing a consecutive mass breakout, with Jin included, the prisoners on level 6 who didn't break out of their cells were later released by Marshal D. Teach, or Blackbeard, and his crew, the Blackbeard Pirates, who appeared after Luffy's group departed. Teach then went on to recruit those who wanted freedom to join his crew. Those that refused his offer escaped on their own through the pandemonium that Luffy instigated, and one of those many escaped convicts was Byandy World. As the sun was beginning to rise from the east, the perfume Yuta stopped in its tracks when the Vivra card in Hancock's hand stopped moving. As the crew and their passengers checked their surroundings, they were disappointingly confused to find nothing but ocean. This is where the Vivra card led us, but, the pirate empress said, Hem, Luffy grumbled, squinting his eyes in confusion, it's not broken or anything, is it? After a moment of silence, the sea beneath them started to quake. This tremor came so suddenly that the two Yuta pulling the ship cried out in worry as they stared at the water around them. Luffy's pupils suddenly flashed red, immediately sensing a presence approaching from below. You feel that too? Rayleigh asked him, sharing the same feeling. Yeah, Luffy nodded. Wait a minute, Hancock demanded. What's going on? Gloriosa shrieked, her face turning white, and her eyes full of fear as she noticed something massive rising out of the water in front of them. The sudden increase in buoyancy created rough waves in the water, causing a majority of the crew to fall onto the deck or hang onto something to maintain their balance. The only ones unaffected by the shaking were Rayleigh and Luffy, who stood there, their bodies completely still, while they kept their feet planted on the deck, matching the swaying of the ship to keep themselves level. What the crew beheld in astonishment was a giant ship that looked like an artificial island mixed with an aircraft carrier. It consisted of small attachments on both sides, with one on the front of the main structure, which was all covered in trees and buildings. The center of the ship had a large spherical dome with the World Pirate's Jolly Roger on the front, which housed cannons, as well as the ship's primary weapon, a giant cannon. The back of the ship had engines and aircraft runways attached to it. This was the flagship of the World Pirates, the Grosse. Awesome, Luffy muttered in awe as he stared up at it. I haven't seen a ship that big since Thriller Bark. Focus, Luffy. Rayleigh ordered. An island. Hancock exclaimed. Thank you for coming all this way. Shouted a voice coming from the very top of the ship. Empress. Looking up, they saw Byandy World, with Biojack sitting on his left shoulder, stepping out. So far, your sisters are enjoying their stay. World shouted mockingly. As if on cue, the middle part of the ship opened up like a big, metal sliding door to reveal what was behind them. Hancock gasped as she saw Sandersonia and Marigold together in a large birdcage, hanging from above the floor of the interior. Big sis, Sandersonia cried out to her sister. Run away, Marigold called out. More worried for her eldest sister, just leave us. Sonia, Mary, Hancock cried out in worry. We'll get you two out of there, don't worry, Luffy announced. It looks like that kid's here, too. Biojack pointed out before letting out a sickly cough. Belalalo, World chuckled, slightly amused by the youth. He can take a beating, I'll give him that much. Placing his right fist on his hip confidently, he shouted, If you want him back, then you have to come get him. Then the doors that revealed their caged hostages began to slowly close. Hiding them from view once again, I'll be waiting. Once they were fully closed, a pair of cannons appeared from the front of the ship, pointing directly at the Kuja's ship. Hancock immediately took action. Quick, evade them. She commanded, don't let them hit us. At her command, the Yudas pulling their ship turned and began to maneuver around the gross aid while evading cannon fire. They raced as fast as they could across the water to prevent themselves from taking any damage, as the rest of the crew was still struggling to stand up straight. We need to get closer to that island, somehow. 
Muffy shouted, his gaze fixed on the closest deck of the enemy ship. Just a moment, Hancock cried out. The two Yudas pulling the ship were still struggling to avoid enemy fire, but were quickly starting to show signs of fatigue. Luckily, they were able to get the perfume Yuda out of the cannon's range of fire. They think they can avoid us that easily, World said, still standing on the ship's apex. At that moment, several cube-shaped cannons on the side turned to aim, then fired a barrage of cannonballs at the front of the Kuja's ship, where the vessel had no hope of evading them. The Yudas hissed in fear as they noticed the incoming rounds. I got this. Just then, Luffy appeared on the head of the Yuda that was closest to the cannonballs and got in a fighting stance. Shave. Luffy disappeared before reappearing on top of an incoming cannonball and punching it into smithereens with a hacky powered fist. He then quickly used Shave again to jump to the next cannonball and repeated this action until all the cannonballs were reduced to sinking chunks of iron in the water and the Yudas were safe. Luffy then safely landed back on top of one of the Yudas who hissed at him gratefully. Back at the top of the gross aid, World smirked at the display of skill. Well, why do you know, the kid's got a lot of spunk, doesn't he? He commented before turning to buy a jack and demanded, Come on, I need bullets. The old man reached into his coat and pulled out a handful of rounds and handed them to World. More more fiftyfold cannon. World shouted as he threw all the bullets simultaneously toward the young fighter. Luffy quickly turned his gave to the incoming bullets, which suddenly grew fifty times their size, and were coated in armament hacky. Damn it, Luffy panicked. Knowing he couldn't do much to intercept these projectiles, Luffy had to do the unthinkable and jump up in the bullet's path and cross his hacky-coated arms to block them. Slave arrow. Before the rounds could make contact, Hancock fired a rain of arrows that were tipped with a stylized heart design, which came from a pink, heart-shaped bubble in front of her, turning the projectiles to stone on contact. Their trajectory ceased and they fell into the ocean before they could touch the ship. Luffy lowered his arms and turned to Hancock who looked like she just out released an invisible bowstring. The two shared a nod and smiled. What happened? World asked, wondering why his rounds didn't reach their target. This petrifying power of Hancock's comes from eating the Love Love Fruit, a paramecia-type devil fruit which grants the user a special range of attacks that use emotions like lust and perversion to transform their opponents who are captivated by the user's beauty into stone, regardless of their gender. This power extends to non-living objects. With Hancock's unparalleled beauty, there is no other user more qualified to wield this fruit's power. Only those with strong willpower or, in very rare cases, do not find her attractive, are immune to the petrification. Way to go, Hancock, Luffy said, giving her a thumbs up, you were awesome. Hancock turned away in embarrassment, her hands on her cheeks and gleaming at the compliment. She was overjoyed to hear such kind words from the man who melted her recently cold heart. Luffy just praised me. She thought, is this what they call a proposal? However, she ignorantly misunderstood everything about how relationships work. Her little daydreaming was interrupted when a group of world's grunts came running out onto the deck with swords in hand. One of them carried an intact pair of sea prism stone handcuffs, intending to subdue and restrain Hancock and her devil fruit powers. Hey, Empress, world shouted, just turn yourself over to my men, and no one will get hurt. It's up to you. Hancock responded with an infuriated growl. She then jumps high from the railing of her ship, doing an acrobatic flip in the air before landing on the deck of the gross aid in front of World's men. She unleashed a swift roundhouse kick, knocking out several men. Despite her slim and elegant frame, she possessed immense physical strength, using extremely powerful kicks that can easily crush stone. She took up a fighting stance, her leg raised high, and glared furiously at the scrubs before her. You kidnapped my sisters, attacked my ship, and shot at my beloved. The pirate empress shouted, eyes filled with rage, death is too sweet a mercy for you. Never mind, guys. World called out to his men. You can go ahead and kill her. Hold on, world. Biajack interjected. We were supposed to take her as a hostage. We can always nail her dead body on a pole and head to Marineford. World retorted, kill her. Love love beam. Hancock fired a heart-shaped beam from her hands, targeting the rest of the men who were all too distracted by her beauty. After the beam died down, all that was left in its wake were the petrified bodies of the men, stuck in a swooning pose of affection. What, again? World pointed out. So, it's true. Biajack added. She really can turn people into stone. Luffy took that moment to join Hancock on the deck of the enemy ship. Landing next to her, he praised her feats of power. Nice one. He cheered with a wide grin. That's showing M who's boss. Why you're too kind. Luffy, she muttered in blissful embarrassment. Back on top of the gross aid. Biajack was stroking his beard, pondering once again. I know that kid, the old man thought, wasn't Luffy the name of that pirate, Straw Hat. Those idiots, World said, disappointed at the incompetence of his men. It's like they're begging me to kill them. Puru 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 puru. A transponder snail on Biajack's person started ringing. 
answering it with a colic. He held it up next to World's face. Don't worry about it. Captain, said a man's voice coming out of the snail, I'll help you dispose of them. Sebastian, good. World responded, I'll give you five minutes. How kind. But two minutes is all I'll need. Back on the deck, Luffy and Hancock were readying themselves to charge into the entrance of the gross aid's interior. Are you ready? Hancock asked. Yeah, Luffy answered. They both made a beeline dash to the front entrance. Go straight. We'll get in through that opening. Luffy nodded. Before his eyes flashed red again, alerting him of a presence in their path. Great water shot. A voice echoed from the inside. A great torrent of water came hurling out at them from the entrance, targeting the pair. Reacting on instinct, Luffy quickly wrapped his arm around Hancock's waist in a tight grip. Shave. He managed to dodge the blast of water, dashing to the side and saving them both. Gently letting her go, much to Hancock's disappointment, they heard heavy footsteps as someone emerged from the dark opening. Shishishi. The figure laughed. So, you want to get your friends back? Stepping out onto the deck was a very large and muscular Watton fish man. With black hair, blue skin with green spots on his head and shoulders, as well as fin-like ears, fins on his shoulders and elbows, and a dorsal fin on the top of his head. His apparel consisted of a violet vest with a white collar and red bow tie, as well as two white cuffs with black buttons on his wrist, similar to a tuxedo. He was wearing dark blue pants with black shoes and a golden belt buckle in the shape of a fish. Finally, he wore a pair of dark sunglasses over his scarred eyes. The sharply dressed brute was Sebastian, the half-fish man, half-giant hybrid, and senior member of the World Pirates. Don't worry, you'll be together soon enough. In hell, Sebastian claimed before bringing one of his clubs down to crush the two intruders, who both managed to back in time, evading the attack. Landing safely, Luffy grinned, cackling in amusement, excited that he can finally test his new hacky skill against a worthy opponent. Bumping his fists together, his arms flared with armament hacky, prepping them for a battle-hungry skirmish. Ready to bust some heads, Luffy shouted, Bring it on, wasting no time. Hancock pressed on with her retaliation against the Watan, but Sebastian was able to intercept her powerful kicks with his immense size and the strength that went with his build. After realizing that she wasn't getting anywhere with her assault, she jumped back to gain some distance. Standing straight, she held up her hands, shaping them into the shape of a heart. Step aside, if you know what's good for you. Or, she yelled, perhaps you'd rather be turned into stone. Love Love Beam The pink, heart-shaped beam enveloped her target. It had no effect. Shishishi, Sebastian chuckled, sneering down at her. Why isn't it working? Hancock yelled, trying to figure out what was wrong. Surely, no one's taste in women could be that bad. So sorry, Sebastian said, lifting his sunglasses, revealing his squinting eyes with milky white pupils. Turns out that I'm blind, so your power means nothing to me. Don't take it personally. Hancock gasped, shocked that she would encounter an opponent with such a defense to her powers. How about you sharpen your teeth on something harder, then? Luffy shouted from behind Sebastian. Quickly turning around, he saw the black-haired youth suddenly appear right in front of his face, causing him to flinch. Hawk Bullet, using the basic principles of finger pistol that he knew, and applying it to his entire hacky-coated fist, Luffy decked Sebastian across the cheek with blinding speed, causing him to drop his weapons, his sunglasses to fall off, and sending him crashing to the deck, stopping on his back. In the wake of Luffy's attack was a smoking, deeply bruised, knuckle-shaped dent branded into the Watton's face. Sebastian lay defeated on the deck, groaning in pain with blood leaking from his mouth and nostrils. Damn, he struggled to say in a broken voice, you really, thought me good, kid, and with just, one punch, ooh, he fainted, wait, that's it, Luffy said disappointingly while tilting his head to the side, deactivating his hacky. He looked down at his hands and repeatedly clenched them, I mean, I didn't hold anything back, but now I don't know my own strength, looks like I've got Rayleigh to thank for that. Nice work, Hancock cheered for her beloved as she ran to his side. Thanks, Luffy said, pouting, but I'm a little disappointed. I thought I was finally gonna get a decent fight. Putting a hand on his shoulder, Hancock tries to cheer Luffy up, and you will, once we find World. Luffy was then reminded of how easily World beat him the first time with little effort. Now that he knew how his more more powers worked, he was ready for a real challenge. Appreciating the kind gesture from the pirate empress, he nodded and went running off across the deck around the ship. Let's go, Hancock. He said. Hancock smiled, blushing innocently at the sound of her name. Oh, why, yes, dear. She giggled and happily followed him. Before the three-way fight began, World and Biajak stepped down a ladder to the inside of their ship, in a room that appeared to be the bridge, which was located just above the room where they held their hostages. Looking out the window, the pair barely saw the fight's conclusion. Oh, Sebastian, World said, this is a disappointment. Seeing the two victors running off to another part of their ship, World growled, I can't believe it. He opened his large hand towards Biajak, who was still sitting on his shoulder. 
understanding the gesture. The old man rummaged through his coat before pulling out another transponder snail and placing it in World's hand. Come in, Garam. World spoke into the snail. Lead me to the intruders and be quick about it. Roger, Captain. Another man's voice replied from the snail. World grabbed Biajak with his free hand and dropped him roughly onto the floor, landing on his rear. The old man wasn't hurt but was still shocked by the harsh treatment. Keep an eye on the hostages, will ya? World said as he walked down the spiral staircase. Despite what just happened, Biajak crawled to the edge of the staircase. Be careful, world, he said worriedly. As Luffy and Hancock were running off, Sebastian was able to quickly gain consciousness but was unable to move. Come back here, he said in a voice too quiet for his targets to hear. If you think this fight is over, you're dead wrong. Look at that sad little fishy face. Sebastian flinched at the new voice. He couldn't see who it was, but he knew someone else was there. Floating above him was a young woman with unusually big, round eyes, red lipstick, black eyeliner, and long, light pink hair that was tied into pigtails with black and white flower hairpins. She wore a red crown with a black cross on top, a short, long-sleeved shirt that was short enough to expose her abdomen and had three different black heart shapes on it, a red mini cape with a pink ribbon on the front, black and white striped tights that were completely covering her legs, a mini skirt, a red and gold belt with a heart-shaped buckle, and a pair of red buckled boots. She was also carrying a cute, red devil-shaped parasol. Floating next to her were what appeared to be a couple of silly-looking ghosts with black round eyes and thick lips with their tongues sticking out. This ghost-accompanying girl was Perona. You might make a cute slave, she said playfully, pointing to the down Watton before crying out. Negative extra big hollow. Go get him. She produced a couple more ghosts and sent them flying right at Sebastian's bleeding form. The ghost passed right through his body, and just like that, his spirit was even more broken than his body as he muttered miserably, If, if only I had been born as a little amoeba, then life would be so simple and free of all this violence. Horo 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 horo. Perona giggled. Never mind, I don't want you anymore. This ghastly power of hers was granted by the hollow hollow fruit, a paramecia-type devil fruit which allows the user to produce ghosts known as hollows with a variety of abilities and grants the user the properties of a ghost, like flying and phasing through solid matter. Negative hollows have the power to rob their victims of their will to fight or live by phasing through them. Noticing the commotion, Hancock looked behind her as she kept running and spotted Perona. Who's that? She asked. H.M. Luffy also turned around, noticing Perona. What the hell? Huh? Perona yelled. Taken by surprise, is that straw hat? Hold on. Hancock turned toward Luffy and asked, do you know her from somewhere? Maybe. But not at the top of my head, he answered before calling out to Perona. Hey, thanks a lot for slowing down that fish dude for us. At his words of gratitude, Perona's cheeks blushed faintly. Hey, my actions were independent of whatever mess you've gotten yourself in. Chalk it up to coincidence, okay. She turned before ranting bashfully. Besides, my friend said he needed to go somewhere, so I just came along to pass the time. I had no idea the likes of you would be here, otherwise, I would have stayed at home. At the moment she finished her dialogue, the floor beneath Luffy, Hancock, and Salem suddenly opened up to form a square-shaped hole, causing them to fall below the deck of the island-sized ship. Oh, Nuo, Perona screamed, watching them fall through the darkness. From the bridge above, Biajack witnessed the whole scene unfold. That flying girl just called him Straw Hat. The old man said to himself, I see, so it's true. Geez, what's wrong with this ship? Luffy complained, rubbing the back of his head. As a sign that he was still getting used to his relatively fragile body, floors aren't supposed to do that. He and Hancock were recovering from the fall they had after landing on a stone floor, wherever they were. It was one of the most bizarre places either of them have been to. They were in a long corridor with the walls and floor all made up of cubes, which were made up of every substance and texture imaginable, resembling a small child who had stacked up his wooden building blocks to make a pretend city. The architecture looked completely messed up and unstable. Hancock was still on the floor, facing away from Luffy. Her body started shaking as if she were cold. Luffy, she called out, sounding a little panicked. Are you certain you don't know that girl? Huh? Luffy turned to her in confusion. That cute flying girl following us. She added, finally showing her worried face. Oh, yeah. Let me think. Luffy pondered while scratching his cheek. I think I saw her back on Thriller Bark. Pretty sure she was our enemy then, but I don't remember her name. Hancock turned around and gasped, putting her fingers over her mouth. He's playing dumb. She thought, then asked herself, infidelity. This is infidelity, isn't it? A now grumpy Luffy had his hands on his hips as he looked back and forth between both directions of the strange corridor. Damn it, where are we supposed to go now? He growled in annoyance. Rayleigh, who was watching from the sidelines, was impressed that Luffy was able to defeat such a large opponent with just a single move. If he was fighting alone, not that Hancock contributed much, 
he would have yielded the same results without even trying and without his devil fruit powers. He could only imagine what his pupil was capable of after he gets his powers back. His inaction in this situation was because he promised Luffy that he would not intervene in his fights, and only step in if his student was about to die, since he couldn't afford to let Luffy kick the bucket. But that didn't mean he couldn't have a little fun of his own. After Luffy and Hancock fell through the floors, Rayleigh made himself scarce and jumped overboard, gently landing on the deck of the gross aid and casually sifting through the downed bodies of world's grumps. He remembered seeing one of them holding an unbroken pair of sea prism stone handcuffs and decided to take them as a souvenir. Once he found what he was looking for, he went back to the perfume Yuta, staying out of sight of any interlopers that might show up at the scene. There wasn't much he could do for Luffy now, not without the risk of being discovered, except wait for him and Hancock to return. As they continued running through random corridors for what felt like hours, Luffy and Hancock couldn't find a way out of the accursed maze that they had fallen into. It was like a giant puzzle made up of cubes, leading them this way and that way. There were so many corridors that it was impossible for them to get their bearings. What kind of place is this? Luffy asked, panting as he ran, why is it like a maze? Not expecting an answer, they continued to run until, after turning another corner, they spotted a bright light at the end of the next corridor. Running toward it, they ended up in a large, open space, with several pathways and unmarked corridors to choose from. Finally, Luffy said, relieved, I thought we'd be stuck forever. Wait, now where are we? Hancock glanced around the room, frowning. At this point, any direction will do. She said before pointing to a random pathway. Come on, let's try this path. Gotcha. Luffy agreed. With Hancock and Salome being the first to make it through the entrance, a large block of solid stone fell from above blocking the entrance, and Luffy's path was cut off between them. Luffy, Hancock's stifled voice called out from the other side, You're not hurt, are you? What happened? Luffy looked up at the top of the cube that blocked his path. Standing on top of the block was none other than Byandy World. This time, without Biajack, the man was looking down, smirking darkly at Luffy at the sight of it all. He chuckled, I could kill the Empress, but I think I'll have some fun with you first. Hancock, don't worry about me, go find your sisters. Luffy called out, hoping Hancock can hear him. But, Luffy, hurry, he insisted. All right, then, I'll go, she said hesitantly. Please be careful, my love, we shall meet again. Yeah, I got this, Luffy said, glaring up at World. World, watch out for that kid, said Biajack's voice. Hem, World pulled out a transponder snail, to which Biajack continued. He's no normal boy, so don't underestimate him. Huh, World was in slight disbelief. He remembered the story, right? He's that upstart, the one who raided Marineford to rescue his brother, Porcas Diaz, from execution. He's the leader of the Straw Hat Pirates. You're facing Monkey D. Luffy. I'm sorry, who? World asked, still unconvinced that Luffy was a threat. Oh, you know him. The Navy Vice Admiral, Garp, is his grandfather. That seemed to have tipped the scale for World. Wah, you mean the one who throws cannonballs? He shouted in shock before looking back at Luffy. Are you telling me, this twerp is the reason that Navy headquarters has fallen into ruin? I don't believe it. Luffy continued leering at him, anger boiling up inside him. World went back to his usual, dark smirk. So, you saved that brother of yours, or not? Luffy's eyes widened in horror, as the memory of Ace dying in his arms flashed back, haunting his mind. That's what I thought. A wimp like you isn't strong enough to save anybody. World taunted Luffy, who fell for it. Shut the hell up. Luffy yelled in fury as he jumped up at World, pulling his fist back. With anger clouding his better judgment, he forgot to use Hacky. He just wanted to make World pay for disrespecting Ace's death. World vanished, causing Luffy's punch to miss. He reappeared above Luffy before kicking him to the floor with a heavy thud. Luffy winced painfully, trying to get up. He didn't feel World using Hacky in that kick, but it still hurt like hell. He forgot how fragile his body was now, but that made him realize how important that was to his training. His anger then died down to moderate levels, finally managing to get back up. Luffy spotted World standing behind him with his back turned. Luffy shut his eyes tightly, trying to activate his observation hacky. When a heavy fist came charging at him from behind, Luffy was able to avoid it by a hair by crouching. Shave, Luffy called out, giving him an opening. Luffy came back around World and wrapped his arms around the larger man's neck, taking him by surprise in a strangling hold. Get off me, World grumbled angrily, trying to shake him off. Before he realized it, his energy was rapidly starting to leave his body. His hands were now too weak to break Luffy's grasp. What the hell have you done? World demanded, his struggle starting to die down, bringing him to his knees. See Prism Stone, Luffy answered with a grin, it's part of my training. I gave myself a handicap to make myself stronger by getting used to how they feel. What? World screamed in shock, barely seeing the sea prism stone cuffs on Luffy's wrist's handicap. 
So you have devil fruit powers. I thought those were just weights. They're not weights, they're the real deal. Luffy answered, still keeping his arms in a firm grip around World's neck. You cocky little bastard. Filled with undying rage, overshadowing the sea prism stone's draining effects, World pulled himself off the ground and charged at one of the name cubes that made up the wall. On a collision course, at the last moment, World's body made a quick 108 idig and slammed Luffy into the queue. Luffy let out an agonizingly painful scream at the impact, which loosened his grip on World. The black-haired young man slowly slid off World's back, but before he could hit the floor, World punched him square in the gut, pushing him into the same queue. Luffy coughed up a fistful of blood. His body now lazily inlaid into the cracked cube, now with a large, knuckle-shaped dent imprinted below his ribs. Not giving him time to recover, World delivered a swift kick into Luffy's X-shaped scar, sending him crashing through the cube, shattering it, and revealing another room on the other side. Luffy winced heavily at the impact, his body still not used to the sensitivity of blunt force trauma. You're not dead yet, World asked in annoyance, walking into the dark room, that was a pretty sneaky move you pulled off, Brad. But you're not the only one who uses underhanded tools. The room they were in was filled with shelves stacked with every kind of weapon you could think of. Everything from bladed weapons to projectile weapons was sorted neatly in piles and shelves. This is my weapon storage, World said. Feel free to use whatever you want. World walks over to a stack of double-edged swords and picks one up before tossing it on the floor next to Luffy. Swords, going to another shelf, he reaches out for a spear and tosses it. Spears, Luffy was starting to get pissed off at the display of mockery World was flaunting in front of him. World continued throwing random weapons at Luffy, guns, hammers. You can take what you like, then maybe this'll get fun. Getting himself back up, Luffy pushes the weapons away before finally getting back on his feet. I don't need any of that crap. That pride'll get you killed, World said in annoyance, picking up some shuriken. I don't need any weapon. Unfortunately for World, he unintentionally gave Luffy plenty of time to recover and focus all of his senses. He realized too late the folly he had ensured when he saw Luffy undergoing some sort of transformation. Luffy's arms, legs, and much of his chest flashed with armament hacky. The edges of the black coating resembled wispy ends of flames, giving it a tattoo-like appearance. The shading of armament extended across his face, which reached around from ear to ear and over his eyes, resembling a bandit mask. His pupils flared red with the concentration and perceptions of observation hacky, which also released a chilling shockwave with flashes of black lightning, conqueror's hacky. World didn't notice his hands trembling at the shockwave until he dropped all the weapons and tools he collected, making a loud clattering sound. All I need is guts, he shouted, flexing his hardened muscles and getting into his typical fighting stance. This was the new form that Luffy discovered during his intense training with Rayleigh. This astonishing transformation was the culmination of observation. Armament and Conqueror's Hacky all combined into one form, and most notable of all. Dot 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 and no devil fruit powers required. Fourth gear, Stick Man, completing his transformation. Luffy's piercing red eyes glared at a shocked Biondi world, whose arms were shaking at the sight of this overwhelming display of power. Snapping himself out of this intimidating distraction, world quickly grabs a large spike ball flail hanging from the wall and starts swinging it around above him. More more fiftyfold speed. The flail was now spinning so fast that it seemed invisible, causing a strong gust of wind to blow throughout the room, sending a majority of the lighter weapons to fly around the room like they were caught in a tornado. Furious hammer. World shouts as he brings down the propelling weapon onto Luffy, stopping the strong draft. Once the dust settled, it revealed the spiked ball at the end of the flail stopped right above Luffy, who caught one of the large spikes with a single, hacky-coated hand just inches above his head. Luffy didn't even flinch or take a single step. What? World shouted in disbelief. Is that all? Luffy asked in a low, casual voice, not giving him time to react. Luffy tossed the spiked ball over his head, pulling World closer to him and causing him to lose his balance. Luffy closed the gap dashing underneath World's falling form before delivering a powerful uppercut to his gut, causing him to lose his grip on the flail and sending him flying toward the ceiling. World's flailing body rocketed up, before recovering in midair, coughing up a splash of blood. He puts a hand over the spot where he got punched. Looking down, World sees Luffy rocketing towards him with a powerful jump. He now understood why Sebastian was taken down so easily. Also realizing that he seriously misjudged the young, black-haired fighter. His first and easy win against Luffy had made him overconfident, which has now come back to bite him. But he thought of a way to turn the tables around in his favor again. More more seventyfold. Eagle. Luffy chanted at the same time. Speed. Gattling. In an act of desperation, World unleashed a barrage of hacky-coated fists down toward the incoming youth, to which Luffy was able to intercept and counter every single punch with his own with equal speed. 
They both yelled out in their assaults, creating small shockwaves with every impact, with random streaks of small, black lightning radiating out of Luffy. Still think I need a weapon? Luffy shouted through his teeth, his arms still punching away. Don't push your luck, kid, he yelled. You're just wasting your hacky. Hundredfold speed. The speed of world's punches increased even further. Luffy couldn't keep up and was overpowered with devastating blows to his entire front before crashing back down to the floor, creating a small crater on impact. After the dust settled, he was panting and hissing in pain. World landed in front of Luffy's fallen form, towering over him like a mountain, before he could get back up. World quickly picked up the shuriken he dropped earlier and threw them at Luffy, trapping his arms and legs, completely immobilized onto the floor. There was nothing Luffy could do to fight back or defend himself. Already, the hacky of his fourth gear was starting to fade away. Just as I thought, World said, grinning, you're too reckless in your actions and that came at the cost of your brother's life. Even now, you're no different. Luffy flinched severely. Hearing those World again hurt him more than any punch he had to endure. And World knew that. You may have powered up a little in this new form of yours, but how long did you think that would last? World said, pointing out Luffy's flaws. If you had come here without sealing your devil fruit powers, whatever they may be, you might have actually put up a decent fight for more than a minute. Luffy growled at his mocking declaration. Not convinced. Then allow me to teach you a little something about Haki, World declared, despite its useful capabilities. There is a limit. If you overuse it, it'll deplete, rendering you vulnerable to the point of exhaustion and you won't be able to use Haki again until you give it time to recharge. Luffy was shocked at this new information. He just got the hang of using Haki whenever he wanted but had yet to learn from Rayleigh about the repercussions and negative side effects. Before he could attempt to break his binds, World slammed his hacky coated fist right into Luffy's stomach, causing him to scream in agonizing pain, coughing up blood, and his eyes rolling in the back of his head. The world around him began to fade away in darkness. If you leave now, you might never see your friends again. A wimp like you isn't strong enough to save anybody. Luffy's mind was haunted by hurtful memories of his recent failures, reminding him of how being reckless led to the misfortune that he and his crew had suffered in the past. I never want to make them go through that again. And worst of all, it led to him losing the only brother he had left. I'm so pathetic, so weak. You're too reckless in your actions and that came at the cost of your brother's life. He hated to admit it, but World actually had a point. Throughout the entirety of Luffy's journey as a pirate, he only relied on his strength to get the job done. Mainly, his role was to beat up whoever was the strongest of any enemy faction that he encountered while leaving his crew and allies in the dust. Luffy was always so optimistic, having so much unconditional faith in his friends to break through any obstacle that they may encounter. In the end, they all came home with a few cuts and bruises. Some suffered far worse injuries than others. But Luffy didn't realize sooner that the further they traveled into the Grand Line, the stronger and more enemies there are. And their defeat at Sabayati Archipelago, which led to the crew's separation, was the clincher. Even though they were lucky enough to reach the end of Paradise, the halfway point of the Grand Line, they were far from ready to consider taking on the challenges that awaited them in the New World. That's what all this training was for, so Luffy would never have to worry about endangering his friends again. He wanted his crew to see him as the leader that they all deserve, because, without his friends there with him, he would have died shortly after he first set sail. To him, being a better person meant changing who he is, to become the most powerful fighter, to become a captain that his crew can truly depend on, to become king of the pirates. Come Uan, wake up already, idiot. Time's a wastin. Get back out there, you damn fool. Luffy's unconscious face was currently getting slapped silly by a clown, sitting right on Luffy's chest, whose limbs were now free from their bindings. Trying to slap him awake was a slim blue-haired man with clown makeup and a big, round red nose on his face. Part of the motif was he had crossbones in the form of an X painted down his face, two blue lines over his eyes, and red lipstick. He wore a red and white striped shirt with short sleeves, white clown issue gloves, a gray sash around his waist with a matching scarf around his neck that was tucked into his shirt, a pair of loose pants reaching down to his calves, just above his striped socks and pointy shoes. Hanging from his shoulders was an orange, fur-lined captain's coat. He also had an orange hat with his Jolly Roger on it sitting atop his head. Buggy the Clown, captain of the Buggy Pirates, the latest addition to the Seven Warlords of the Seas, former pirate apprentice of the Roger Pirates, one of Luffy's first rivals, and a completely misjudged fraud. Despite his title and history, Buggy was a complete weakling compared to most pirates. The only notable thing about him was the power he gained from eating, albeit by accident, the Chop Chop Fruit, a Paramecia-type devil fruit that allows him to split his own body into pieces and control them however he liked, with the added bonus that he is immune to slashing attacks. What's your problem? Buggy screamed while he continued his wake-up slaps. If you want to take down World, quit lying around. Get back up and fight, damn it. Putting a pause to his slapping, 
Buggy was now panting, his face dripping with sweat. After catching his breath, he was about to deliver another slap until Luffy's hand lashed out and grabbed the clown's hand to stop him. Looking down, Buggy saw that Luffy's eyes were snapped open and reignited with his flame of determination, which freaked him out. Hissing for breath, Luffy muttered, Maybe I can save them, maybe I can't, but I'll never know unless I try. Buggy was flung off of him, causing him to hit the ground behind him. Luffy's fighting spirit had returned with a vengeance, his eyes blazing with new resolve. Standing back up, he glared around and noticed Buggy's crew, not even bothering to ask why they were there. Turning to their captain, Luffy demanded in a venomous tone, Tell me, which way did he go? Fearful of the revived straw hat captain, the Buggy pirates all simultaneously answered in unison without hesitation while pointing to the doorway behind Luffy. He went that way. After thanking his unexpected benefactors, Luffy went running towards the doorway, or, in his fragile state, stumbled, leaving Buggy and his crew behind. That guy better be ready for an ass kicking. Luffy shouted as he ran haphazardly, I'm coming for you, world. Screaming and running through yet another confusing, cube-ridden maze, trying to find his way out, Luffy quickly found himself lost again. I don't get this place, he whined, where the hell am I going? Suddenly, while trying to get his bearings, the corridors around him started getting blocked off by cubes coming out of the walls, floors, and ceilings, leaving Luffy with only one unblocked path to take. It must be a trap, but what choice do I have? He asked himself while running. In his haste to try and find a way out, cubes were coming out of random places, trying to crush him. But with his observation hacky, he was able to detect where and when the cubes would appear, dodging them with minimal effort. He spots a light at the end of the corridor. Able to avoid the last of the crushing cubes, he made a wild jump through the opening and rolled into the large room, which was free of any cubes. He found himself in some sort of massive engine room, with a large engine in the center of the room that was connected to the wall with a single set of pipes and a control panel. It didn't take Luffy a second more to realize that he wasn't alone, though. Standing near him was a middle-aged man with a drop-shaped, rotund body with thin arms and legs, cube-shaped pigtails in his hair that were tied with an orange band and a thick mustache and eyebrows. He wore a pair of blue-rimmed goggles with green lenses, a blue shirt with white stripes, with the sleeves rolled up to his shoulders, brown gloves with matching boots, and a red scarf around his neck. Strapped to his back was a huge hammer, with two large metallic cubes connected to the top. Gerarara. The old man laughed. Welcome aboard my ship. I'm Garam, the man who ate the cube cube fruit. Now, with my powers, I can shape anything into a cube. So this is the bastard responsible for all those annoying cubes, Luffy thought, irritated. Reaching for his massive hammer, he slams it into the floor in front of him, shouting, Observe. For a moment, it seems as if nothing happened. Then, suddenly, several towers of cubes started rising out from the floor, creating a wall around Luffy, trapping him. More cubes, Luffy growled, before jumping high through the opening at the top. The moment he was free, Garam appeared in front of him, about to strike him with his hammer. Luffy quickly crossed his arms to block it, his arms coated in hacky. He gets knocked to the ground, but quickly recovered. Looking up, he sees Garam standing on top of the Tower of Cubes. Come on, kiddo, are you serious? Garam asks, you think I'm gonna let you reach the captain that easily? Try this. Garam places a hand on top of the cube he was standing on, chanting, Cube Booster. A bunch of miniature cubes start shooting out of the larger cube before they were sent flying around Luffy. Like angry bees, the mini cubes start circling around him like a swarm. Luffy, activating his observation hacky, starts punching the cubes that flew straight toward him. Being able to deflect every cube, Garen decided to step up his game. He uses his powers to push one of the larger cubes from his tower, sending it on a collision course to Luffy, who seemed distracted by the mini cube swarm. But he underestimates Luffy's perception. Shave. Luffy vanished from the eye of the swarm, reappearing closer to the larger cube that was on the move. Pulling a hacky coated fist back, he shouts, dot 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 and hawk bullet. The cube was shattered into gravel. What? Garam yelled in shock. That cube was made out of corundum. Even with hacky, it should have taken more than that to break it. Luffy's eyes widened with wonder when he looked at his hands. The hacky coating now had a slight shade of red, while the base color was still a shiny black. Well, that's new, Luffy muttered curiously. Before either of the two combatants could jump back into action, they heard a voice coming from the cube corridor. Crap Hat must have beaten World by now. Time for us to take cred. I I mean see how he's doing. Stepping into the room were Buggy and his crew. Who are you? Garam demanded. Wait a second. You must be that other guy that Biojack mentioned. Why are you here? Before he could get an answer, Luffy dashed past Garam and escaped through another corridor, leaving Buggy to pull his own weight for once. Hey, get back here, Straw Hat. Buggy called out. Kick his ass, Buggy. Luffy retorted, having more important things to worry about. Luffy had a lot more on his mind as he ran. 
First of all, he wasn't happy to admit that World was right about him when he said he was reckless in his actions, but he proved that statement earlier when he overpowered Luffy, even after activating fourth key, stick man. This was only the second time Luffy had attempted this transformation. The first time, he could still use his devil fruit powers. In his haste, his body had burned through more energy and hacky than he could supply, which lead to his easy defeat. When you fight someone with devil fruit powers that made them faster than the speed of sound, it was nearly impossible to keep up with them, even with observation hacky. Luffy had to completely change his game plan if he wanted any hope of defeating Biondi World. One of the obstacles that caught him off guard earlier was the mention of Ace's death. World made Luffy believe, for a moment, that he was the reason he lost his brother. But, remembering way back, on the battlefield of Marineford, Luffy was too exhausted to stop Ace from falling for Admiral Akainu's taunt and attacking him. And when Luffy was in a vulnerable state, Akainu took that opportunity to execute the rubber man. But Ace didn't die because Luffy allowed it to happen. He died so his little brother could live. Luffy was too stubborn to die in the first place but was equally as stubborn when it came to taking risks. Before he even made it to the battlefield, Luffy had spent some time recovering from the various deadly poisons that he was exposed to from fighting the Warden of Impel Down. In his haste to rescue Ace, Luffy pleaded for the assistance of his new ally, Emporio Ivankov, to speed up his recovery, which came at the cost of reducing his lifespan by 10 years. With Ivankov's Horm Horm fruit powers, his request was granted. This was a prime example of Luffy's folly, one of many that he wishes not to repeat. From now on, no more crazy stunts. With his heart set on overcoming this latest obstacle, Luffy reviewed what he knew so far of World's Devil Fruit powers and came up with a countermeasure. And this time, he's gonna win. After dashing through the corridor for a few minutes, Luffy found himself in yet another large, open room. Looking around, he saw that he was completely surrounded by iron walls, with large, protruding, iron spikes covering every inch like some sort of giant iron maiden. He noticed the hole in the floor, assuming that was where he was sent flying out of. High above him was a large birdcage, hanging from the ceiling. Luffy, Luffy's thoughts were interrupted when he heard the cries of familiar voices coming from above him. He spots Sandersonia and Marigold locked in the birdcage. Guys, are you okay? He shouted back. The girls smiled at him in relief. Don't worry, I'll get you out. Just hold on a sec. Luffy jumps up high reaching for the edge of the cage. He climbs up to the lock, gripping the bars between the door and the cage tightly. He tried his best to pull them apart, but the bars wouldn't budge. Careful, Luffy, Sandersonia warned, this cage of made out of sea prism stone. That's why we haven't been able to escape. Seriously? Damn it. Luffy retorted angrily until he remembered what Rayleigh demonstrated to him not long ago. Hold on. He recalled how Rayleigh was able to crush the chain of his handcuffs with a single hand. A green aura flowed into the chain, destroying it from within. That's it. Luffy perked up with a grin firmly gripping the bars with his now hacky-coated hands. Luffy took a deep breath before letting out a smooth exhale, closing his eyes to focus all of his senses, picturing how Rayleigh managed to pull off internal destruction. So far, there was no reaction after using all his basic senses, so he tried applying a thicker layer of armament hacky. The results were the same. Switching to observation hacky. He looked deep within himself and noticed something. A vision of a spark, followed by a flurry of cherry blossom petals. Opening his eyes, he was startled when he discovered that his hacky-coated arms were now covered in a red, flowing aura. Gritting his teeth, he tightened his grip on the bars. After they were easily crushed, separating the latch from the door, he quickly pulled the door wide open. Before he could forget this new tingling feeling, Luffy remembered what he had to do once he unlocked this power. He quickly brought his right hand over the sea prism stone cuff on his left wrist. And just like the cage, it broke just as easily. He threw the broken cuff away before quickly moving on to the last one. He was able to crush the last one, but not enough to break it off completely, when he was interrupted by a large fist slamming into his face, knocking him back onto the floor. Luffy, the Boa sisters called out. Luffy was able to recover from the fall a lot easier than he had before. He suspected that some of his rubbery powers have returned to his body. Grasping the feeling that the elasticity was back, he still could stretch far on his own yet. He still needed the other cuff off. A loud thud sounded in the center of the room, revealing Biondi World landing heavily on the floor. You've become quite the pest, World said. Why can't you just give up and mind your own damn business, you pathetic little brat? You think you can kidnap my friends? Not gonna happen. Luffy shouted back, standing back up. Besides, Luffy paused, holding up the hand with the broken cuff still on it. If I couldn't even pull off something like this, how could I protect my crew? World raised an eyebrow, hiding his shock that Luffy was able to advance his hacky to be able to crush Sea Prism Stone. That thought was then overshadowed by his next claim. Your crew, is that really what you're so stuck on? You're so transparent. This is all because you couldn't save your big brother, isn't it? World expected a reaction of horror from the boy. 
Dot 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 but Luffy didn't budge. Though, World continued, trying to taunt him. By the way, just where are these beloved crewmates of yours? I pity them. Having someone as reckless as you as their captain, you'll only lead them all to an early grave. Luffy's expression didn't change, but he did clench his fist. I only came here to save the girls, Luffy said, but I didn't expect to find something more while I was here. Something that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. Fay, World spat. And what could you have possibly found here, besides your tomb? Luffy slowly closes his eyes before taking a deep breath. World's answer came in the form of Luffy's left arm, coated with hacky, grasping the remaining cuff on his wrist. The same red aura that he used on the cage started emanating from his hacky again, with a slight grip. Dot 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 the last cuff came off and was thrown across the room. My resolve. The rubber man was back in full force. World smirked in response, excited that maybe he was finally gonna get a decent fight, now that there are no longer any reserves. Balalalo, I'm gonna put an end to this in 30 seconds, World said, arrogantly. You won't beat me this time. The two combatants were about to throw down for one final tussle. You won't beat me this time. World merely smirked at the rubber man's cocky attitude. He kicks the ground in front of him and thrusts his hand forward. More more tenfold shotgun. The pebbles and dust that World kicked up shot toward Luffy like bullets, forcing him to dash out of the way. He quickly pumps his legs to accelerate his blood flow. Second gear, Luffy jumped into the air and stretched his arm back to give it more thrust. Gum gum. At that moment, World grabbed a handful of the debris before jumping at Luffy and grabbing a hold of his leg. Thinking fast, Luffy's arm shoots toward World's ugly head. Jet bullet. Luffy slams his accelerated fist into World's face, sending the man spiraling toward to ground. He quickly recovers Madeira and lands safely. Rubbing a thumb over the bleeding wound on his face, World started fuming with anger. Luffy, still steaming, glared at World with a calm and cool expression, waiting for him to make the next move. World charged madly at Luffy, coating his entire body from head to toe in armament hacky. Luffy stood his ground, waiting for the right moment to predict his movements and intercept them accordingly. His eyes flashed red for a moment as he could see that World was about to unleash a flurry of blows. To match his power, Luffy applied Hacky to his arms. More more seven to fold speed. Gum gum jet gattling. Blow after blow. Their fists clashed in a barrage of punches powered by Hacky and a determination to win. Periodic flashes of black lightning sparked from Luffy's side while sending a small shockwave of concorders Hacky at his large opponent. This invisible disturbance made the destroyer of the world flinch, losing his grasp on his current assault and slowing him down, giving Luffy an opening. His jet gatling was now pummeling away at World's hacky coated chest, ceasing his own punches. Luffy screamed out as his lightning fast punches were finally putting this rotten old man in his place. The rubber man finally ceased his attack, seeing that World was still on his feet, but groaning in pain as he now had noticeable bruises all over his front. That was for kidnapping Hancock's sisters, but Luffy wasn't finished with him yet deactivating second gear and hacky. He then puts his thumb between his teeth, third gear, and blows air into it. His entire arm was now inflated like a balloon, growing to the size of a giant's arm. He pushes all the air into the end of his arm, which then became a giant fist with an elephantine round wrist. He coats his enlarged fist in hacky before charging at the stunned world. Gum gum elephant gun. The giant, black fist came flying at world, who suddenly broke out of his daze and smirked sinisterly at the incoming attack. Just before Luffy's fist could connect, World jumped up high while pulling his arm back and shouting, More more twinifold shotgun. He throws the debris, which he picked up earlier, at Luffy, who saw the projectiles coming but didn't have enough room for defense. Without much time to think, he covered his face with his free arm before getting pelted with the hacky-infused pebbles, which Luffy couldn't deflect. Screaming in pain from getting multiple deep wounds, Luffy pulled his inflated arm back. At that moment, Luffy's arm deflated, the air escaping through his mouth like a geyser. Just as the last of the air got out, Luffy's entire body shrinks down to the size of a toddler. He fell on his back, gasping for air. He didn't know until now that, because of his constant exposure to sea prism stone, the old side effects of shrinking after using a third gear technique were back. Even though he managed to get rid of the side effects before Rayleigh placed a handicap on him, the effects from the sea prism stone were still lingering in his body. It takes about a minute for Luffy's body to reform to its usual shape and size, but that was time that he couldn't afford. Looks like my prediction was spot on. World said as he walked toward Luffy menacingly, 30 seconds exactly. Luffy did it again. He prioritized brawn over brains. He stared at World, who was looking down at Luffy's pitiful form. Crap, what's wrong with me? Luffy thought, nothing's changed at all. What am I gonna do? World wrapped his beefy hand around Luffy's tiny little body and picked him up like a plush toy, without the energy to resist. Luffy could only croak as World puts the squeeze on him. Save your friends, huh? And your brother, World said, huh? You can't even save yourself. 
Before World could think of what to do with Luffy next, the whole ship started shaking, followed by the sounds of cannon fire coming from outside. World kept his firm grip on Luffy while looking around and trying to figure out what was going on. What's going on now? World demanded until he was interrupted by Biajack's voice from atop the spiral staircase. The Navy's here, the old man shouted, and they're launching an all-out attack on our ship. The impact from a much larger blast shook the entire ship, causing an explosion above them. The ceiling gave way and the open birdcage that was still holding Sandersonia and Marigold detached itself from the chain that was holding it and came crashing to the ground, causing the girls to fall out. Hitting the ground hard, their bodies lay there motionlessly, paying them no mind. World was distracted by the top of the room being blown off, letting in the bright light of the sun. The metal and wood around it were being melted by streams of lava as if the ship was struck by an erupting volcano. The Navy. The Lalalo. World chuckled. Perfect. What now, World? Biajack asked worriedly as he came down the stairs. I didn't expect the Navy to fall into our lap. Time to change our plan. We got the perfect opportunity to hit him where it really hurts. World turns to the old man before commanding, Prepare the cannon. Are you mad? Biajack shouted back. If we fire from such a close range, our whole ship's going to sink from the impact. The old man coughed sickly. Who cares? World shouted, Just get it ready. But I thought the ship was. Biajack started fearfully. Was what? A symbol of our freedom? World finished in disgust. Biajack gasped in shock, taken back by the dark look coming over World's face. Don't you get it? This ship's just a tool for getting what I want. World snarled with a dark grin, the rest of you always clung to your foolish dreams. But I made up my mind long ago, even before I escaped and fell down. Then you guys picked me up in this ship, and I saw that massive cannon. So I did what anyone else would do. I decided to take advantage of the situation and use it to achieve my own goals. It's not like you can blame me. You did a good job building it. You've been using us all along. Biajack fearfully confirmed. Is getting revenge on the world government all you care about? And so what if it is? I don't care about the ship. And I sure as hell don't give a damn about what happens to you dirty traitors. But Garam, Biajack was horrified at the man's words. And Knighton and Sebastian too, they fought for you because you're their friend. Yeah, right? World spat venomously. I haven't trusted you or anyone else since the very beginning. I don't really need any of you and I never did. No way, Biajack said, refusing to believe it that's not the brother I know. Luffy, still coiled in World's meaty fist, flinched. They are. Brothers. You lot aren't any different from this ship. World walked near the fallen birdcage, picking up a handful of rubble that was laying around it with his free hand, and tossing it up and down, just a bunch of tools, and nothing more. World, no. Biajack cried out, tears building up in his eyes. He may be my brother, but if you can't follow orders, World said, pulling his arm back as he was about to throw the rubble at his brother, then I don't need you. Gum gum balloon. Before he realized it, World's throw was suddenly cut off by Luffy, who instantly inflated his body like a balloon, causing World to lose his grip and push him back. How dare you stop me? World shouted. This is between me and my brother. Why don't you mind your own damn business already? Without giving him a straight answer right away, Luffy deflated to his normal size again. Panting lightly, his eyes were shadowed over by his black hair. His fists shaking in anger, his teeth clenched tightly, and hacky coating his arms, Luffy growled. A bunch of tools. Is that what you said? He demanded coldly. That's what you think of your friends? Your brother? Yeah. What's it to you? Huh? World asked. At that, Luffy just lost it. Screw you. Luffy shouted in rage. Moving fast enough, Luffy delivered a solid punch to World's face, his hacky-coated fist glowing with a shade of red as they made contact. World was sent crashing to the ground, his one-horned helmet falling off and rolling across the room with a loud clattering sound. Luffy, called out a concerned voice. Looking toward the corridor he came from, Hancock emerges, running with Salome behind her. For some reason, her dress was torn up and full of holes, as if it was eaten by termites or corrosive acid. Thankfully, her privates were still covered, but her body left little to the imagination. Not that Luffy really cared. Hurry, Luffy shouted back at Hancock. Grab your sisters and get out of here now. World sits back up, recovering from Luffy's punch before noticing Hancock, the pirate empress. Me and this guy have unfinished business. Luffy declared as World got back up. Hancock saw the two men glaring at each other. In a moment, she understood the situation between them before nodding at Luffy. She then went over to the wrecked birdcage, shaking her sisters awake. Mary, Sonya, Hancock called, let's go. Big sis. They both called out as they woke up, relieved to see their beloved sister. Pushing themselves up, they made their way to the exit, hoping to get back outside, where the perfume Yuta was waiting. Before heading back to freedom, Hancock stopped to warn Luffy. Careful, as soon as you've taken care of him, come straight back to the ship. Hancock called out before running after her sisters. She knew she could trust Luffy to make it back alive. You got it. Luffy called out. This blowhard is mine. 
It doesn't matter. I don't need the Empress as a hostage anymore. Now, World stated before looking back at Luffy, you wanna keep fighting? Go right ahead. Getting into their fighting stances, it momentarily became a standoff with the two combatants staring at each other without so much as a blink. Suddenly, Luffy broke the staring contest by closing his eyes, raising his head, and taking a deep breath. This only seemed to amuse World. If you're saying a prayer, don't bother, World sneered, nobody can save you now. And who's gonna save you? Luffy shouted back, opening his eyes and shifting his body into second gear. You cocky, little brat. World shouted back as he coated his entire body in armament hacky. Throwing the first heavy punch, Luffy dodged, dashing behind him, and slugged him hard in the face, knocking him back. World steeled himself before staring at Luffy, whose fists were burning hot with red shaded hacky. I'm not losing to an arrogant jerk like you again. Luffy roared as he delivered a stretched, sidewards kick into World's gut, knocking the wind out of him for a moment. World was in a raging fit as he retaliated with a series of punches, but Luffy was able to predict and avoid all of them swiftly and with ease. Friends are not tools that you can just use and throw away. World finally managed to land a punch right in Luffy's face, but the rubber man grinned as he blocked it with his hacky-coated forehead. There's nothing wrong with abandoning the useless. World smirked arrogantly at Luffy. After all, you left your brother to die at Marineford. Luffy blinked. That wasn't gonna work on him anymore. He had finally overcome Ace's death while at peace with the fact that he died while protecting his little brother. None of World's taunts and lies were ever going to bring him down again. You don't know anything. Luffy shouted, stretching both arms backward, far across the room. Gum Gum Eagle Bazooka. Luffy's arms delivered a lightning fast impact to World's gut, blasting him across the room. Just before he reached the deadly spikes decorating the walls, World recovered after coughing up a bit of blood, now having more burning wounds to his person. But what you said earlier, you were right, Luffy said out of the blue, causing World to look at him while covering his newest injury. Luffy was slowly walking toward the injured destroyer of the world. I was weak. I couldn't save Ace's life, but he sacrificed himself so that I could keep on living. I'm still alive, and I'm never gonna let his death be in vain. I still have my crew, my friends who believe in me, and I want to protect them. They're all waiting for me to get stronger. Enough, already. World shouted out before striking. But Luffy moved fast enough to dodge with disappearing speed. World was able to keep up with Luffy. And soon their brawl continued in midair, both fighting equally as hard, going completely on the offensive and ignoring any pain that they endured. I will become stronger. Luffy yelled through his attacks. I will protect my friends. And I will become king of the pirates. The pace of the battle was increasing, with both hitting the other harder and faster, with World being unable to keep up with Luffy any longer. The black-haired fighter's full strength and speed were returning with every punch he threw, giving him the chance to pound World hard enough to fling him backwards, causing his back to crash back down onto the floor. Brother, Biajack cried out worriedly. Luffy landed, his face still raging as can feel his power continuing to rise. But before I do that, I'm kicking your ass. He yelled. You're stubborn. World raised his head, baffled as he muttered, dot 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 but that's not enough. To beat me, World wasn't out of the picture yet. He pushes himself up, concentrating the last of his hacky into one final attack. But he wasn't the only one thinking that. Gum gum. Pumping more blood through his body, Luffy yelled out as he unleashed all his might, hawk gattling. More more hundredfold speed. World shouted, his whole body coated in hacky once again. The two collided, yelling and unleashing hell upon each other. Their punches caused mild shockwaves throughout the room, while streaks of black lightning were on Luffy's side. Slowly, but surely, World was being overpowered. His opponent's punches pushing him back. World knocked Luffy's hands back as he jumped towards him in a desperate attempt to finish him off. Luffy shut his eyes and threw a fist behind him, putting every last ounce of power he had left. He coated his arm with what remained of his hacky. Gum gum. Shouting as he opened his eyes, his arm began to feel hotter and hotter, causing it to glow red hot. This made World's eyes widen in shock as the burning fist came back. Zooming through the air, Luffy's arm grew so hot to the point that it exploded in a burst of golden flames, covering his fist in fire. With a powerful roar, Luffy brought the fist forward, punching World square in the chest. The impact was hot enough to send a blaze of fire through his body, which then burst out from his back. Red Hawk World was sent flying even harder than before, causing him to crash into the spike-ridden wall, impaling the large man. He cried out in pain as blood flew out of his mouth, but still seemingly alive. Biajack feebly made his way to his dying brother's side. Catching breath, Luffy panted heavily as he shifted out of second gear. He stared at his arm, the flame slowly dying down. What is this? Luffy croaked as he stared at the dying flame in confusion, since when could I? The moment just before it was extinguished, Luffy could have sworn he saw the flame change from gold to pure white. After his mysterious flame and hacky faded away, 
Luffy was suddenly interrupted by a loud explosion from outside that shook the whole ship, causing him to lose balance. His fight with World pushed him to and beyond his limits, which rendered him in an exhausted state, remembering that the Marines were here. Luffy knew that he was out of time and had to leave. Knowing that it was finally over, he gazed over at World's defeated form one last time. I promised, Rayleigh and Hancock that I'd make it back. Luffy muttered, limping toward the exit, so there's no way I'm dying here. My friends are still waiting for me. Passing through the exit, out of sight of the now-defeated world pirates, Luffy whispered, it was a good fight. By Indy World, not long after departing from the site of his recent victory, Luffy, once again, finds himself lost in the cube-ridden corridors. If I ever see another cube again after this, it'll be too soon, he muttered having no idea where he was going. Now, where's the stupid exit? In his exhausted state, he ran slowly in a crooked serpentine pattern. It was harder to keep his balance with all the shaking and explosions that were causing the ship to fall apart. Looking frantically for a way out, the tremors were suddenly getting worse, causing more of the ceiling to collapse around Luffy. What now? He cried out exasperatedly, losing his footing. The magnitude of the shaking grew even further when an avalanche of rubble was falling toward Luffy. Too weak to move, he lowered his head and shut his eyes, bracing for impact. But instead of getting buried alive, he suddenly felt someone grab him before feeling a draft rushing through his hair. He opened his eyes to reveal Rayleigh carrying him with his arm over his shoulder while speeding through the collapsing corridors. Rayleigh, Luffy cried out weakly. The old man smiled proudly as he turned toward his student. You did good, Luffy. Now, you can relax, I'll get us out of here. Luffy nodded, sighing in relief as he finally dozed off in his teacher's hold. It was unclear to Luffy why Byandy World and his brother, Biajack, had such a broken relationship. But now that the Navy destroyed the gross aid completely out of the water, with the defeated World Pirates still on board, now he'll never find out why. World's toxic words to describe his crew and his intentions for them really pushed Luffy's button. For the short time that he knew the destroyer of the world, he was easily able to analyze his character. He was someone who destroys everything in his path, with no regard for the collateral damage he causes or the consequences of his actions. When the repercussions finally caught up to him, he discarded the well-being of his crew, his ship, and even his own brother. To him, that's not how pirates are supposed to live. To Luffy, pirates should be people who set out to sea in search of freedom and adventure, as well as fulfill their dreams. Not a bunch of despicable savages who destroy, conquer, plunder, and ruin other people's lives. When he overheard the World Brothers' argument, Biajack mentioned World trying to get revenge on the World Government, but they didn't mention the reason why. Luffy knew the World Government didn't tolerate pirates unless they were one of the seven warlords of the seas, but they were the reason that pirates aren't to find the way that Luffy envisioned. The government may hate pirates, but they're the ones who created them. But, someday, Luffy was going to change all that. Change the world's view on pirates. All the people who knew Luffy as their friend knew better than most people that he and the other straw hat pirates weren't like most pirate crews around the world. Their crimes and track record as a crew consisted of defeating evil pirates, deposing corrupt marines, stopping a civil war, destroying a navy stronghold to save one of their crewmates while declaring war against the world government by burning down their flag, sailing on a ship built out of illegal wood, assaulting a celestial dragon, invading the most fortified prison in the world, and getting involved in a war between the marines and the whitebeard pirates. The feats of the straw hat pirates have managed to leave a trail of miracles in their wake. Compared to the rest of the world, Luffy's crew were pacifists, and once Luffy finds the One Piece and becomes king of the pirates, he is going to create a brand new era, an era of freedom, dreams, and adventure. That is his dream. Speaking of dreams, Luffy was finally starting to wake up. Opening his eyes, he saw Rayleigh, Hancock, and the rest of the Kuja pirates sitting around him. Hancock was wearing the same dress as before, but now this one was intact. He was lying on a bed inside the perfume Yuta. Luffy, Hancock cried out in relief as she flung herself at him in a tight embrace. Oh, I'm so glad that you're awake. I was so worried when Rayleigh brought you back to the ship. Pulling back, she placed her hands on his shoulders and asked worriedly, You're not hurt, are you? Looking around the room, everyone was smiling, but Luffy didn't think too much of it and just smiled back with his trademark grin. Rayleigh walked closer to his student before pointing out, I see you managed to get those cuffs off, finally. Letting go of Luffy, Hancock backed away, giving Rayleigh some space to talk to his protege, who helped up his newly bandaged arms. After seeing the state Luffy was in after Rayleigh brought him back on board, Hancock immediately commanded her crew's healers to patch up his wounds. Luffy spent most of the ride back to Lascaner resting while he recovers. Yeah, it was weird, Luffy answered. I can't really remember how I did it, but I think I was cherry blossoms while I was focusing on my hacky. Next thing I knew, my hands glowed red, and then I could easily break the cuffs off like they were made out of glass. Rayleigh closed his eyes and nodded proudly. Good, you've already started to get a feel of internal destruction. 
With a few more months of training, that feeling will become second nature. For now, before we get back to Lascana, tell me everything that you learned. At that moment, Luffy got the feeling that the rest of this trip was going to bore him to death. After the climactic showdown against the World Pirates, Luffy and Rayleigh were safely dropped back off on Lascana by the Kuja Pirates, where they can continue their training. During the boat ride back, Rayleigh asked Luffy to report what transpired while he was on board the Grossi. The rubber man explained every detail that was requested of him, much to his annoyance. He recalled how his first fight with World was an eye-opener for his recklessness. Using too much hacky at once burned through more energy than his body could provide, a lesson that Luffy quickly took to heart. Rayleigh reassured Luffy that he was planning on teaching him that lesson further on since multitasking wasn't Luffy's forte. With the awakening of internal destruction, their next lesson was to completely master that power. Before they said their farewells to the Kuja pirates, Luffy couldn't help but ask Hancock why her dress from earlier was torn apart. Assuming he wanted to bond more intimately with her, Hancock gleefully explained how she fought the doctor of the world pirates, Knighton, a short, elderly woman with light purple hair. She wore pink eyeliner and a pair of swirly designed glasses, a lab coat, a pink dress, and pink high heels. During the fight, she was able to overcome Hancock's beauty by consuming a variety of medicinal herbs which, due to their immense bitterness, allowed her to resist Hancock's charms to a certain extent. After drinking a rejuvenating mixed beverage, her body changed from a short 80-year-old hag back to her prime as a young, tall, attractive woman with no wrinkles. Knighton's style of combat was known as Kanpo Kenpo, where her vast knowledge of herbalism was adapted into a fighting style. The strange concoctions that Knighton used on her opponent included a powder that dissolved the fabric on Hancock's dress, tearing it up to the point where it was barely hanging onto its wear. But, with enough teasing and innocent acting, Hancock was able to break Knighton out of her spell until she ultimately defeated the doctor. In the end, Hancock's charms were too much for her opponent. Luffy didn't know what kind of answer he was expecting, but he wasn't really satisfied with it. He thought the pirate empress was just trying to seduce him again. Thanks to Rayleigh, Luffy started opening his eyes to women but chose not to think about it until his training was over. Getting stronger was his top priority. By the time they arrived back in Lascana, its winter season was already setting in with blankets on thick snow covering the entire landscape. After being dropped off, the teacher and students said their goodbyes to their Amazonian friends before making their way back to their campsite were reignited the campfire to cook the game that they caught on their way back. It was currently dusk, so the two decided to continue their training tomorrow. As the large chunk of meat on a bone continues to cook like a spit, Luffy and Rayleigh sat around the fire on logs that they used as makeshift seats and, sometimes, hard pillows. They both wore thick pelts wrapped around them for warmth. The former was deep in thought, recounting the recent events. Rayleigh, who was enjoying his drink, spoke up first. So, let's review. You seem to have gotten a grip on observation hacky, that's good. Make sure you keep practicing this talent. Those who master it to the fullest can even glimpse into the future. Really, Luffy responded. That's amazing. What are you going to do when you come across someone who can do that? Think you can take them on. Even after your training is over, you might not be able to make the cut, you know. It'll be really tough even if you're pushing yourself even harder. I guess. It'll just depend on what the person is like. Hmm. Rayleigh raised an eyebrow at that. You mean their personality? Why does that matter? I never thought of it that way. Well, of course, it matters. If I can get a good read on my opponent before a fight, maybe I can find out what makes them tick. When I was a little kid, Grandpa once told me that anger makes you stupid. Rayleigh chuckled at that last statement. Ha ha ha. Well, your grandfather's not wrong. The old man was expecting Luffy to laugh along with him but got a frown out of the boy instead, still holding a grudge against your old man. Rayleigh asked. Yeah, Luffy answered begrudgingly. When I was little, he nearly killed me over and over again, calling it training. What did he do? Rayleigh asked curiously. He threw me into a ravine, left me in the jungle at night, tied me to a bunch of balloons then sent me flying, and punched me more times than I could count. If I didn't eat my devil fruit before all that, I would have died ages ago. Hem, Rayleigh pondered. Sounds like your grandpa was trying to toughen you up. It was torture. Luffy cried out. He said he did it to make me into a man, so I could become a marine. But I told him a million times that I wanted to be a pirate. The befuddled grandson slammed his knuckles into his palm in frustration. I swear, if I ever see him again, I'm gonna give him a fist of love. See how he likes it. Rayleigh put a hand on his student's shoulder to try and soothe his rage. Parents have their own special ways of expressing their love for their children. You may think he was trying to control you, but maybe he didn't want you to know how he truly felt. Whatever, it doesn't matter anymore. Luffy pouted. How about we change the subject? Rayleigh suggested. You said that you were able to remove the sea prism stone handcuffs with your bare hands, right? Tell me how you did it. Luffy raises his right hand, staring into his palm. I felt my hacky flowing through my fist, 
and then my whole body started to tingle. When I saw those red cherry blossoms, I felt a new sort of power flowing through me like I could do anything. Maybe I can even grab lightning. Rayleigh laughed at that remark. Maybe you can, Luffy. Maybe you can. Luffy smiled. By the way, I had another look at Vegapunk's encyclopedia about your devil fruit, and I saw something I probably should have reminded you about. Luffy looked up at his teacher curiously. Yeah. What's that? After you awaken your powers, the encyclopedia mentioned that it would give your stretchy powers more freedom and creativity. That's what we should focus on when we get to that stage of your training. You need to jailbreak your devil fruit by stretching more than you ever have before. I can even give you some ideas if you'd like. Anyway, I'll get the next lesson underway. I'll give you an hour to rest, so you'd better eat fast. There are some tough times ahead, so you'd better be ready. Got it, Luffy replied. Thanks. Fourth gear. Luffy coated his arm in armament hacky and bit into it, blowing air into his body and inflating his muscles. His size and proportions become much larger and warped. His arms, torso, and legs were coated with flaming tattoo-like hacky. His shoulders were also wrapped around with a thin, wispy, white cloud of thick steam like a floating scarf. His hair turned sharper and billowing like a flame. Bounce man. In this form, the added emphasis on Luffy's upper body makes it hard for him to keep his balance, so he has to bounce on the spot constantly. Hmm. Rayleigh stood a fair distance away from Luffy, with a few of the large native animals watching from the back. You're getting rather creative with your armament hacky. You've hardened your skin, but your elasticity has improved a lot as well, hasn't it? That's only the start. Luffy said as he jumped high into the air. The transformed rubber man compressed his legs into his body before quickly thrusting them out simultaneously and pulling them back in. He repeated this process until the pressure generated by his legs made him airborne. As Luffy was now gliding in the air, his teacher from below was amazed at the way his student was applying his rubbery powers. Hem, you're filling yourself with air and using compression to fly. Rayleigh commented, but what about your offensive abilities? Stand back and check this out. Luffy bit into his arm again and filled it with even more air, growing it to the size of a giant's. Flying towards a nearby mountain, he begins compressing the enlarged fist into his forearm. Gum gum. King Kong gun. Reaching his target, he unleashes a colossal short-range punch with devastating power at the mountainside, completely reducing the rocky pillar into pebbles and dust. The spectators watching from the sidelines were amazed at the display of power. The giant animals were getting wary of Luffy after witnessing the destruction he just caused. Now, the beasts knew they had to stay on Luffy's good side. Wow, that's very clever. Rayleigh praised as Luffy landed back down. By filling even more air into your fist and compressing it into your arm, you can throw a split-second punch at point-blank range like a giant piston. Yep, bounce man, huh. That name certainly gets to the point. Rayleigh then smirks at Luffy. Not bad. Luffy flinched, knowing that his teacher was about to test him in a spar. Let's put it through a more rigorous test, shall we? Rayleigh suggested with a devious smile. Pain can be a very effective teacher, right? Luffy reminded himself. Good, he remembered. In the blink of an eye, Rayleigh suddenly appeared in front of Luffy before delivering a punch into the bounce man's gut, sending him crashing into the nearby trees and into the base of the recently destroyed mountain. It didn't hurt Luffy that much, but the shockwave from the impact was powerful enough to shake anyone. What's wrong? That was only one punch. Rayleigh called out playfully. In the wake of Rayleigh's attack, Luffy was left bouncing on his back in the rubble of stone. Damn it, Luffy complained as he recovered. Rayleigh came charging at him again. If you have time to complain, then fight back. Luffy quickly compressed his legs again for a high jump, allowing him to dodge Rayleigh's punch. Once he was at a safe distance, Luffy compressed both his arms before rocketing back toward his sparring partner. Gum gum. He unleashes a point-blank double punch. Leo bazooka. Dot 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 but misses, and instead destroys more of the rubble. Where'd he go? Luffy looked around frantically through the dust. He turns to a laughing Rayleigh who was standing behind him, who was standing in a calm and mocking pose. Try hitting me this time. The old man taunted. If I charge at him again, he'll just dodge it. Luffy thought with a growl, I need to be faster than I am now. Then let's see if you can keep up with this. Taking a deep breath, let out some of the air in his muscles through his mouth, shrinking himself until he was at least half the size he was as bounce man. What also changed was that his hair was now sticking up and flame-shaped, like his hacky. The scarf-like gaseous substance around his shoulders became longer and thicker, as it now appeared to be a mix of steam and fire. Snake Man. Fancy, Rayleigh commented. Hunt him down, Python. Gum gum. Luffy extended his knuckles into a leopard fist before compressing it. He unleashed a long-range attack at even greater speeds. Jet Culverin. The attack came barreling towards Rayleigh so fast that he had trouble keeping up with its speed, even when using observation hacking. Whoa, Rayleigh explained in surprise. You were able to gain more speed and mobility by deflating yourself to the point where your body can compensate for the dot dot dot. 
Rayleigh suddenly sensed a hardened fist flying toward his face from the side, pulling his head back. He barely dodges the speeding leopard knuckle. At that moment, Luffy's arm retracted before he regurgitated all the added air that he stockpiled in his muscles, deactivating fourth gear. Once the air was out, Luffy collapsed on his back, both completely exhausted and immobilized. Rayleigh, processing what just happened with his student, walked over to Luffy's depleted form. You're putting your body through more strain than you can handle. The old man said, shaking his head in disappointment. We'll put the practical tests on hold until your body can cope. Rayleigh bent down to pick up his helpless student before leaning him over his shoulder. Let's get you patched up, kid, Rayleigh said. Hold it right there, Dark King. The old man flinched at the rough sudden voice nearby. Turning to the edge of the jungle, he saw someone emerge from the foliage. It was a tall, tanned, broad-chested, and muscular old man with a beard and a stitched scar over his left eye. He wore a red tropical shirt, light-colored shorts, and sandals. In his hand, he held a large, brown duffel bag. Despite his exhaustion, Luffy flinched before looking up at the source of the all-too-familiar voice. Gee, Grandpa, he said weakly. Thought you could get away from me, did ya, Luffy? Said Vice Admiral Monkey D. Garp. Well, this isn't good, said Rayleigh. How did the Navy find us? A week ago, we received an anonymous tip from one of the seven warlords, Garp answered. They said they saw Straw Hat Luffy escaping from the ship of the World Pirates before sailing away with the Kuja Pirates. Luffy's anger was beginning to rise, both from seeing his detestable grandfather again and hearing the news that someone reported to the Navy about his sighting. Someone sold me out. And it was one of the warlords? But who? The only warlord who was there was Hancock, but she wouldn't do something like that. Luffy thought. Luffy got Rayleigh to put him down but barely had the energy to stand up straight. Who was it? Luffy demanded, glaring furiously at his old, old man. Garp raised an eyebrow in annoyance, shocked that his grandson still wouldn't respect his elders. The point of an anonymous tip is not knowing where it came from, you little dumbass. Garp shouted back. Luffy snapped. Don't screw with me, you bastard. It's bad enough that I have to look at your stupid face again after you let Ace die. Garp's eyes widened in shock. He had never seen his grandson so angry before in his life. But he couldn't really blame him, since all he did was sit there and watch instead of doing anything to prevent Ace's public execution after he was captured and turned in by Blackbeard. However, Garp did pay Ace a visit at Impel Down and discussed family issues, such as Ace and Luffy turning to a life of piracy instead of becoming marine officers like he wanted. But, deep down, Garp knew that his plans for his grandchildren were destined to fail from the beginning. The hero of the Marines sighed. You're still broken up about that? Huh. I'm gonna kick your ass for what yao wow. Luffy tried running towards Garp in anger but collapsed to the ground after a few wobbly steps. Before he could finish his sentence, Luffy's depleted energy finally took its effect, causing him to black out. After Luffy passed out from exhaustion, Garp calmly explained the situation to Rayleigh who was skeptical at first but decided to listen to what he had to say. He carried his student back to their campsite where he began to tend to Luffy's injuries of the day. While patching up his student, Rayleigh asked the Navy hero what he was doing on Muscana. Since the Pirate Empress lives so close to here, I figured she must be hiding Luffy someplace less conspicuous. So, I scouted around Amazon Lily's neighboring islands. After a week of searching, I eventually ended up here when I noticed one of the mountains on this island getting completely destroyed. That was Luffy's doing, Rayleigh clarified, causing Garp to laugh hysterically. Ha, that's my grandson. Are you here by yourself? Rayleigh asked seriously. Garp sighed, pushing out the giggles. Yeah, it's just me. I was hopping from island to island after I officially took time off from work. Rayleigh raised an eyebrow in suspicion, but he knew that Garp knew how to use Moonwalk, one of the six powers. So, you're not here on the Navy's orders, then? If I was, don't you think I'd be in uniform? Garp smirked. Rayleigh was not amused at his sass. Then, why are you here? Garp immediately switched to serious mode. He sat down on the log that Luffy was lying against, before looking down at his grandson. He knew he had a lot to prove before he can even begin to ask Luffy for forgiveness. He was too lazy to supervise him and Ace when they were kids, but, at least, now, he has the chance to make up for lost time and do something with his remaining grandson that he wished he could do all along, and that was being there for his family. I'm here to help train Luffy. He paused, dot 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 for the new world. You want to train Luffy, Rayleigh said as he glared at Garp in disbelief, dot 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 for the new world. That's right, the Navy hero simply answered with a nod. The two veterans were about to get into a moderately heated argument while Luffy remained asleep. Rayleigh gave Garp the benefit of the doubt and decided to hear him out. After all, the last thing Luffy needs is malevolent intruders interrupting his training. But why? Based on what Luffy told me, you just want to control him. You weren't even there for him when he was growing up. You just dumped him in the hands of a bunch of outlaws. Is it any wonder he turned out the way he did? Garp sighed. 
You're as cut and dry as ever, I see. He chuckled before letting out a sigh. It's true, I'm the one at fault for letting Luffy pursue a life of piracy. All I wanted was to make him into a man and train him to become a marine officer. But I was too stubborn to let him enjoy his childhood. Hell, I almost got him killed on multiple occasions. If it wasn't for that devil fruit he ate, he might not have survived to see today. I hate to admit it, but I think I owe red-haired for that one. That boy was the first of his kind that I haven't seen since Roger's era, a peace main. Rayleigh raised an eyebrow, taken back by the thought that Garp, one of the most exalted marines in the world, actually acknowledged the existence of peace mains. I now see that Luffy fits into that category. I tried to convince him that all pirates were just a bunch of bandits that sailed the seas and had no future. I turned a blind eye to the ideology of what Roger stood for, even though I once fought alongside him to defeat a common enemy. The old war veteran gripped the bridge of his nose, letting out a shaky exhale. But you were right, I wasn't there for Luffy. I wasn't even there for Dragon. Just look at what my stupid pride has done. My son became the most wanted criminal in the world. My adopted grandson was murdered by one of my colleagues. I helped spark a war that created probably the most dangerous pirate to date. And despite all the chaos, I chose my job over my family. Carp then vented his frustration by slamming his fist into a nearby tree, shaking it, and leaving a clean dent in the trunk. This dot 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 this isn't justice, he growled through his teeth. MMM dot 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 wa dot dot dot. Carp's tantrum was interrupted by the moans of his waking grandson, who was most likely woken up by the intense vibrations. Luffy sat up, rubbing the sleep out of his eyes and yawning, when the first thing he noticed was Rayleigh sitting closest to him. Despite being practically in front of him, Garp had not yet been noticed. Hey, old man, can you keep it down? Luffy muttered tiredly at Rayleigh. I'm trying a... Eh? Luffy's vision was starting to come into focus as his eyes shifted to the all-too-familiar figure standing just a few feet away with his arms crossed. His mind goes back to the unexpected arrival of his grandfather back in the clearing. You, Luffy hissed as he squinted at Garp angrily. Luffy's first instinct was to pull off the blanket covering him and throw an enraged punch into his grandfather's face, just like he did at Marineford. However, he managed to compose himself enough to take special precautions to keep himself from rushing into a fight he can't win. He knew full well what kind of power his grandpa pulled behind those punches, and considering their history combined with how seriously he takes his job, Luffy knew he wouldn't last five seconds. Easy, Luffy, Rayleigh stepped in to stop his student from getting out of hand. Luffy stared at his mentor out of the corner of his eye for a moment in silence before glancing back at Garp, seeing the passive look on his face, letting out an exhale through his nose. Luffy leaned back into his makeshift bed and folded his arms impatiently. What are you doing here, old man? Honestly, Garp was expecting far worse. Garp sat down on a log, making himself comfortable before answering his grandson. Well, I already explained my reasoning to Rayleigh, and I don't like repeating myself. So, to summarize, I'm here to help you. Luffy flinched in disbelief before exclaiming, What? Why should I believe you? How do I know you're not just here to arrest me? Garp understood why Luffy was giving him this much lip, but that didn't stop him from getting back into his grandson's good graces. Luffy, I'm, why are you really here? Luffy interrupted, feeling a surge of anger at the old marine, remembering how Garp had failed to protect Ace when he had the chance. No, forget it. I don't want to talk to you. You let Ace die. Before he could get another word out, Luffy lowered his head and panted for air. He was still feeling the effects of the intense training from earlier. During Luffy's recovery, Garp monitored him closely, but with the intense guilt washing over him and making no steps to deny it, dark shadows showed on his face, hiding his eyes. He was guilty. The whole kaleidoscope of doubts and emotions he hadn't felt for a long time had pushed him to the brink of vulnerability. Garp hung his head, his voice barely above a whisper. I know, Luffy, and I'm sorry. I failed both you and Ace. Ignoring the pain, Luffy slowly looked up at Garp. He felt a twinge of guilt at the pain he could see in Garp's eyes. He knew that Garp had loved Ace just as much as he did, and that the old marine had been carrying his own burden of guilt since the war. But, I don't understand, Luffy said hesitantly. Why didn't you do anything to stop it? You're a marine. You could have stopped the execution. Garp looked up at Luffy, a tear starting to form in his eye. I couldn't, Luffy. I couldn't bring myself to fight against the marines, even for Ace. I was a marine for too long, and I couldn't betray my duty. Luffy looked at Garp for a long moment. Then his expression softened. I don't like it, but I, I think I understand, Gramps. I still can't forgive you, though. At least dot 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 not yet. Garp looked at Luffy in surprise. Then a look of relief washed over his face. Thank you, Luffy. That means a lot to me. Luffy smiled at Garp, feeling a weight lift off his shoulders. I'll keep moving forward, Gramps, Luffy said, and I'll make sure that Ace's memory lives on. That's what he would have wanted. Garp nodded, his own resolve strengthening. Oh, there's something else that I should have told you a long time ago. 
This time his tone was so completely different compared to the strict and demanding voice that he used to address him, hit him, and lecture him. Luffy was stunned momentarily. His voice husky from fatigue again, what is it? Garp nodded gratefully before straightening his posture and clearing his throat. Back when Roger first started out as a pirate, he earned himself an unusual reputation. The man became more famous than infamous. Even as a pirate, he never attacked ordinary civilians unless they asked for it. All the treasure and wealth he gained before he found the One Piece came from looting other pirates who attacked him or swiping them from some ancient ruins. What's your point? Luffy asked. My point is, Roger was, what we in the Marines would call him, a peace main. Luffy looked at him in confusion at the unfamiliar word. What's a peace main? They're a type of pirate that cares little about treasure and, instead, are more motivated by the sense of adventure. Not to say they wouldn't steal or fight other pirates at all. They work towards peaceful resolutions and avoid conflicts as much as possible, Garp explained with the tone of a professional storyteller. Luffy scratched his head. But, isn't fighting necessary sometimes? Like when I fought Arlong in Crocodile. That's where the Morganeers come in, Garp replied. Morganeers believe that violence is necessary. They're willing to fight to fulfill their selfish ambitions, even if it means getting their hands dirty. Morganeers currently outnumber peace mains a thousand to one easy. Luffy nodded thoughtfully. So, which one do you think I am? Garp smiled. You're a bit of both, Luffy. Sometimes you need to use your fists to protect the innocent and make sure justice is served. Other times, you can use your words and find a peaceful solution. Luffy hid his smile, I guess I'll have to live with it. He turns his gaze to the former vice-captain of the Roger Pirates. Was the king of the pirates really a peace main? Well, Rayleigh paused. The captain never really put any fancy labels on himself, aside from just calling himself the captain of a pirate crew. I guess some people just recognized a few of his good deeds, which were unusual behavior for normal pirates, and they started referring to our crew as the peace mains on a few occasions. Garp chuckled. That's exactly how I started to see Luffy's crew after I met them back on Water 7. Luffy turned to face his grandfather with a skeptical glare. Wait, if you knew about this all along, then why didn't you just tell me back when I was a kid, instead of trying to force me to become a Marine? Garp took a deep breath before answering. I wanted you to become a Marine because I believe in justice, Luffy. The Marines are the ones who uphold justice and protect the innocent. I wanted you to be a part of that. Luffy frowned. But isn't justice about helping people? Like how my crew and I helped the people of Alabasta. Exactly, Luffy, Garp said, nodding. The Marines are there to help people and protect them from those who would do them harm. I wanted you to be a part of that, to harness your strength and use it to make a difference in the world. The Marines aren't exactly the saints that everyone wants to believe they are, Garp. You know that, right? Rayleigh intervened, his voice calm as usual. Garp sighed. I won't deny that the Navy has seen its fair share of corruption among its ranks, but that's why we need good Marines like you, Luffy. Ones who will stand up for what's right and do the right thing, even if it's hard. Luffy looked down at his hands, thinking, I like helping people, Grandpa, but I don't want to be a part of something that hurts them too. Garp shuffles closer to Luffy, putting his hand on his grandson's shoulder. I understand, Luffy, and I'm proud of you for standing up for what you believe in. Just remember, there are good and bad people in every organization. It's up to us to make sure we're on the right side of things. Luffy nodded, a determined look in his eyes. I can do that. But don't think that I've forgiven you yet. I'm still gonna be king of the pirates one day, so I'm gonna get stronger than anyone in the new world. And I'll help people along the way no matter what. Garp smiled. I know you will, Luffy. And no matter what path you choose, I'll always be proud of you. Luffy smiled back, genuinely. Anyway, Garp exclaimed, patting Luffy on the back. Since I'm here, I've got a whole year in my schedule to help improve your skills before I have to get back to Navy HQ. Rayleigh chuckled. It's good to have you with us, Garp. Luffy could use all the help he can get. Luffy frowned. Hey, I'm not that weak. Garp laughed. Of course not, Luffy. But there's always room for improvement. Luffy pouted childishly, crossing his arms. PFFF. Whatever. The old marine couldn't be any more proud of his grandson, pleased to hear the progress he was already making under Rayleigh's tutelage. The old marine reached into his pocket and pulled out a rolled up piece of paper. Here, Luffy, I have something for you. Luffy took the paper and unrolled it, revealing his latest wanted poster. He looked at the image of himself with a grin, pleased to see that his bounty had increased yet again. Wanted, dead or alive. Monkey D-L-U-F-F-Y. B-H. 400 million. Wow, 400 million berries. That's a lot. When did it go up? Garp chuckled. You always have been quite the troublemaker, Luffy. After what you pulled off at Marineford, it's no wonder the world government has put such a high price on your head. Luffy shrugged. I don't care about the money. I just want to have fun and become stronger so I can become king of the pirates. Garp nodded, a serious look on his face. I know, Luffy, but you have to be careful. The higher your bounty gets, the more dangerous your enemies become. 
You'll need to stay on your toes if you want to survive. Luffy nodded, his expression turning serious as well. I know, Gramps. That's exactly why I need to train harder than I ever have before. And I won't let anyone stop me. I'll keep fighting and growing stronger until I achieve my dream. Garp smiled at Luffy's determination, proud of his grandson for his unwavering resolve. I know you will, Luffy. Just remember, I'll always be here to support you from now on, no matter what. Luffy grinned back at Garp. Thanks, Gramps. And with that, Luffy tucked his latest wanted poster safely in his pocket. He had a long way to go before he became the Pirate King, but with the invaluable training that is to come, his crew by his side, and his family's support, he knew he could achieve anything. After that fateful night, Luffy began his training with Rayleigh and Garp. They started with mastering all three forms of hacky that they both knew, teaching Luffy how to use his observation hacky to not only sense the presence of the world itself around him but to peek mere seconds into the future. Holding nothing back, Garp would dart around Luffy, trying to surprise him, but Luffy's senses were so sharp that he could always anticipate Garp's movement. Next, they moved on to armament hacky, teaching Luffy how to channel his hacky into solid objects, bypassing any defense and destroying them from the inside out. Garp was an expert at this, and he sparred with Luffy, showing him how to use the full extent of his strength, finding nothing harder than stone to test it on. Rayleigh enlisted the help of the Kuja pirates to provide them with large, Thick steel slabs to be used as sturdy training dummies. It was then Rayleigh's turn to help him master his conqueror's hack, teaching Luffy how to not only overwhelm his opponent's willpower, but also utilize it with such precision that he can avoid accidentally using it on his own allies while his opponents will still feel the full force of his presence. Finally, they moved on to the six powers, teaching Luffy how to use his body as a weapon in the event that his devil fruit powers were off the table. Garp was a master of the six powers, and he showed Luffy how to use Tempest Kick to slice through objects, Moonwalk to leap incredible distances, and Shave to move at lightning speed, although Rayleigh already taught him that last one. Luckily, Garp was there to perfect it. It was grueling work, but Luffy was determined to master these techniques. He trained day and night, pushing himself to his limits and beyond. And with Rayleigh and Garp's guidance, he began to improve at an incredible rate. As time passed, Luffy's training continued. He became stronger and faster, his hacky growing more powerful with each passing day. He was almost at his peak, but there was still one final step in his training that he had to accomplish, awakening his devil fruit. And finally, the day came when Garp declared that Luffy had mastered everything he had to teach him. The trio stood on the beach of Lascana, preparing to bid farewell to each other. The old marine had been thoroughly impressed with the progress that his grandson had made over the past year, and he knew that he could leave the rest of his training in Rayleigh's capable hands. You've come a long way, Luffy, Garp said, smiling proudly. I'd say you've got what it takes to become the king of the pirates. However, I know that isn't enough to satisfy you. Rayleigh clapped Luffy on the back. Don't worry about a thing, Garp. I'll still be here to see Luffy's training through to the end, every step of the way. Grandpa, are you sure you have to go? Luffy asked his grandfather sadly. Luffy had come to forgive his grandfather for his follies in the past year. He knew that he couldn't change the past, but he could choose to forgive and move forward rather than hold a pointless grudge. Garp nodded. Yes, Luffy. Duty calls. There are some things that I have to take care of, but we'll see each other again before you know it. Luffy pouted slightly, but he knew that Garp had important work to do. Okay, Grandpa. Stay safe. Garp ruffled Luffy's hair affectionately. Don't worry about me, Luffy. I've been through worse. Just keep up your training and continue to grow stronger. I have no doubt that you'll become king of the pirates someday. Luffy grinned, a determined glint in his eyes. I will, Gramps. And when I do, I'll make sure you're there to see my rise to the throne. Garp smiled back at Luffy, then turned to Rayleigh. Take care of my grandson, Rayleigh. He's still a bit reckless, but I know he's in good hands with you. Rayleigh nodded. Don't worry, Garp. By the time I'm done with him, he'll have already surpassed both of us. Garp chuckled, then turned and prepare a moonwalk trip back to base. As he jumped through the air, he couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness at leaving his grandson behind. But he knew that Luffy was in good hands and that he had a bright future ahead of him. As he glided away from Lascana, Garp couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in his grandson. He knew that Luffy was destined for great things, and he couldn't wait to see what the future held for the young pirate. With only less than nine months left to train and firm determination blazing in his breast, Luffy was going to make every minute on the path to awakening count. It's been six months since Garp's departure. With the full mastery of Haki under his belt, Luffy was now on the path to awakening the human-human fruit, model, Nika. Rayleigh explained to his student that, to awaken a devil fruit, the user must master their ability, but they must also wait for their body and mind to catch up to their power. So, Rayleigh gave Luffy plenty of opportunities to master his powers. He needed to know how to control his powers, use them in various situations, and adapt to different challenges. Luffy had already mastered the basics, 
but he still needed to focus on expanding his abilities, pushing himself to the limit, experimenting with new techniques and strategies, and finding new ways to use his powers to their absolute limit. The most important step was to develop his hacky. Hacky was the key to unlocking the full potential of his devil fruit. It allowed him to control his powers with greater precision, to imbue them with greater strength and speed, and to tap into new abilities that he never knew he had. This was why mastering Hacky was the first step in Luffy's training. After more than a year of living in the hard climates of Lascana, Luffy became adept at observation, armament, and conqueror's Hacky. All that was left was finding a way to forge his newfound power into the key that unlocks his devil fruit's true power. The colossal animals of the island were now completely submissive to Luffy, treating him like their king. The sheer magnitude of the rubber man's growing power quickly dwarfed the instinctive strength of the beast. But Luffy wasn't the type to rule over anything since he won't be staying on the island for much longer. He always believed that freedom was the greatest aspiration, and he refused to take that away from anyone, even animals. To their relief, Luffy chose to befriend the beasts instead of eating them. During the last few months, Rayleigh had set up Luffy to spar with him every day to push him to the limit. Luffy stood atop a rocky outcrop, his eyes closed in concentration. He took a deep breath and focused his mind, calling forth the power of his devil fruit. Fourth gear. Suddenly, his body began to swell and bulge, growing larger until he was nearly twice his normal size. His muscles bulged and rippled, his black hair long and flowing like a flame, and his skin turned a deep shade of red. The steamy substance that coiled around his shoulders became noticeably less opaque, becoming more like a cloud. Snake man. Usually, Luffy would have to bite into his arm to inflate his muscle. But after constant use of this transformation, he eventually gained the ability to make the biting, as well as the constant bouncing in place, redundant. He was now able to inflate any part of his body at will. As he stood there, Luffy felt a familiar burning sensation in his chest. It was the same feeling he always got when he used fourth gear, a feeling that told him he was pushing his body beyond its limits. But Luffy was determined. He knew that if he wanted to awaken his devil fruit, he would need to master this technique. And so, he forced himself to ignore the pain and continue practicing. Are you ready for this? Rayleigh called out from the clearing below. He jumped from the rocky outcropping and landed on the ground with a thunderous boom. The ground shook beneath his feet, and he grinned as he felt the rush of power coursing through his veins. Luffy stood across from Rayleigh, his muscles bulging and his red-shaded armament hacky reflecting the sun's rays. He was ready to once again spar with his mentor and show off his new abilities. Let's go, old man. Luffy shouted, his voice ringing across the clearing. Rayleigh chuckled and cracked his knuckles. Careful, Luffy, the old you is showing. Remember, this is an all-out brawl. I'm not gonna hold back even a fraction of my power, got it. Luffy nodded with a grin. Hit me with your best shot. The two men charged at each other, their fists flying. Luffy moved with incredible speed, darting back and forth as he tried to land a blow on Rayleigh. He felt lighter than air, his movements almost too fast for the eye to follow. But the old man was just as fast, dodging Luffy's attacks with ease. He moved with fluid grace, his body seemingly made of water as he flowed around Luffy's punches. Luffy grinned, enjoying the challenge. He knew that Rayleigh was one of the strongest fighters in the world, and he was determined to show him what he was capable of. He took a deep breath and focused his mind, feeling the power of his devil fruit surging through his body. Gum gum. Then, with a fierce shout, he launched himself into the air, his arms extended in front of him. Hydra. With a fierce shout, Luffy unleashed a flurry of omnidirectional attacks. His fists flew like lightning, each blow striking with the force of a sledgehammer. But Rayleigh was unfaced. He blocked each of Luffy's punches with ease, his body moving like a well-oiled machine, thanks to his observation hacking. Luffy continued his onslaught, his punches becoming faster and more powerful with each passing moment. Eventually, they became too fast for even Rayleigh to endure. He felt a surge of excitement as he pushed his limits, his body humming with power. Rayleigh seemed to be the only one to notice that Luffy was in full control of the trajectory of his attacks, giving him more mobility, speed, and freedom to his elasticity. He saw it as a sign that Luffy was on the right path to awakening. Luffy always enjoyed the challenges that the old man gave him. He knew that Rayleigh was one of the strongest fighters in the Grand Line, and he was more than determined to prove himself. But no matter how hard he tried, Rayleigh was always one step ahead of him. He seemed to anticipate Luffy's every move, dodging his attacks with ease and counterattacking with devastating force. After a few minutes of non-stop punches, Luffy ceased his attack. He knew that using the same attack over and over wasn't gonna get him anywhere, but he refused to give up. Luffy felt a thrill of excitement as he realized that he did manage his own against Rayleigh so far, even in his snake man form. 
But then, something happened. Rayleigh began his next attack, his movements becoming even more intense and ruthless, and Luffy found himself struggling to keep up. Suddenly, Rayleigh's hacky-coated fist connected with Luffy's side, sending him flying across the clearing. He crashed into a tree, his body bouncing off the trunk and landing in a heap on the ground. Luffy groaned, feeling a sharp pain in his side. He struggled to get up, but his body refused to cooperate. He looked up at Rayleigh, his eyes wide with shock. The old man was standing a fair distance from him, a smug look on his face. Don't tell me that's the best you can do. He taunted. Luffy shook his head, trying to catch his breath. Not dot 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 even close. He gasped. He felt a surge of anger and disappointment. He had thought that he was ready to face anyone, but now he realized that he still had a long way to go. With fierce determination, Luffy pushed himself back to his feet. Even after one punch, he was bruised and battered, but he refused to give up. I'm not done yet, he said, his voice low and determined. Rayleigh nodded, a look of pride in his eyes. Then, show what you're made of. The two men charged at each other once again, their fists flying. Luffy was still in pain, but he refused to let it slow him down. He dodged and weaved, his movements more fluid than ever. He could feel his strength and speed returning, and he knew that he was getting closer to reaching the peak of his power. However, Rayleigh blocked, deflected, and evaded each blow effortlessly, his movements smooth and fluid. Finally, after what seemed like hours, Luffy delivered a powerful blow to Rayleigh's abdomen. The old man stumbled back, his eyes wide with surprise. With a final shout, Luffy charged at Rayleigh, ready to show him what he was truly capable of. Gum gum. Pulling his arms forward, he coils them together tightly like a drill. And then, with a fierce shout, he released a rifle-like punch at high speed, unleashing an unstoppable frontal attack at his opponent. Dragon Culverin, distracted by the steamy image of a serpent forming around Luffy's arms. The old man summoned as much hacky as he could to soften the blow. On impact, Rayleigh was sent flying in a spin, his body coming to a stop as he crashed into a few trees, retracting his arms and letting out a relieving exhale. Luffy grinned, feeling a surge of pride. After many months, he had finally done it. He managed to land a solid blow on Rayleigh. Before Luffy could celebrate his self-proclaimed victory, Rayleigh appeared in the air in front of him. Who says we're done yet? He said before delivering a hacky-coated leg into Luffy's face, sending him flying toward a mountainside. The old man wasn't exactly happy about it, but Luffy asked him to treat him as his enemy while they sparred so that there were no reserves of strength between them. Even after mastering his observation hacky to the point that he could see brief seconds ahead of time, Rayleigh was still faster and smart enough to not let Luffy get used to his teacher's fighting style and changed it randomly every time they sparred. Luffy wasn't the only one getting stronger. The rubber man recovered mid-flight before he made contact with the mountain. With a new technique he created by combining the principles of Moonwalk and his elasticity power flight, he rocketed towards Rayleigh like a speeding bullet. But then, without warning, Rayleigh's expression changed. His eyes narrowed, and his conqueror's hacky washed over Luffy's soul. He was prepared to strike back at Luffy with even greater force. The old man disappeared in a blur, his arms flashing with hacky, catching Luffy off guard. He delivered a sucker punch to Luffy's gut, which the rubber man was too distracted to evade. Luffy writhed in pain, gasping for air, and struggling to catch his breath. Rayleigh was not holding back at all. He brought down a devastating kick atop Luffy's head, sending him crashing towards the clearing, his body slamming into the ground with a sickening thud that created a massive dust cloud on impact. Once the dust settled, Rayleigh saw Luffy laying on his back in a large crater with his limbs spread out, his scalp bleeding heavily and running down his face. Luffy groaned, feeling the pain spreading through his body. He tried to stand, but his legs wouldn't support him. He looked up at Rayleigh, his eyes flaring with perseverance. Luffy has suffered worse damage than this, and he refused to back down when things were finally starting to heat up. Rayleigh looked down at him, his expression serious. In a real fight, your opponent won't hold back. You need to be prepared for anything. Luffy knew long ago that Rayleigh was no pushover, being a legendary pirate. They were about evenly matched at this point, but Rayleigh would always outsmart him enough to turn the tide of battle in his favor. Gritting his teeth, Luffy slowly got back on his feet, still maintaining his transformation. He looks up at Rayleigh, grinning like a man possessed. Thanks for the tip, old man, Luffy said, but I'm not gonna let you win this time. The legend and the legend in training were both put through the ringer all day. Before they knew it, the sun was already out of sight. We find our two combatants in a pile of broken earth at the bottom of a large trench. The magnitude of their fight reached a critical point where Luffy's heavier attacks devastated a sizable portion of Lascana, including the ditch they were currently in. Rayleigh, whose body was covered all over with wounds, sat down with his back against the wall of the ditch. He panted in exhaustion while feeling reminiscent of the last time he went all out in a fight. 
While catching his breath, he turns to see the state of his opponent, student. Luffy's condition was even worse. Luffy, out of his fourth gear form, was lying on top of the rubble of the destroyed earth, covered in blood that leaked out of more severe wounds. His eyes were darkened, signifying that he was unconscious. He was unresponsive and his breathing became very shallow. As Rayleigh sat there, looking at his protege, he can't help but notice that Luffy focused more on offense rather than defense. He left himself wide open at almost every turn, which gave the old man many opportunities to strike more often. Maybe dot 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 he wanted this to happen. The old man thought. Luffy pulled out all the stops with his rubbery powers. Throughout the fight, he extended the range of his arms to even further distances while the mobility and speed of his attacks were even greater. Rayleigh was sure that Luffy was on the brink of awakening. Yet there were still no results. Their day-long sparring match was perilous, but the legendary pirate hoped that Luffy at least learned a valuable lesson after his defeat. Feeling exhausted for the first time in so long, Rayleigh decided to nod off right where he sat since he just got comfortable. Badum, 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 badum dot 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 badum, badum dot 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 badum, badum dot 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 dum dot 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 dum dot dot dot. Dum 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 dot 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 dum dot 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 dum dot dot dot. While Rayleigh rested, something strange started happening to Luffy's unconscious form. His chest started pulsing with a musical rhythm. His fingers twitched. The faint sound of a drum started resonating from his chest. His darkened eyes clenched tightly. He gritted his teeth. A wide grin spreads across his face. His hair glowed a bright white. His eyes open wide. His conqueror's hacky flaring to life. He bursts into uncontrollable laughter. She hit ha ha ha. Doom. Dut, da da, dim, dut, da da, dim, dut, da da, eh ha 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 ha. On his back, Luffy bounced up and down on the pile of shattered earth like an oddly shaped mattress. His heart beats in an odd musical rhythm in his chest. Rayleigh was startled awake from his brief nap at the sudden burst of Conqueror's hacky. His eyes widened at his student's strange transformation. Luffy's hair, eyebrows, and blue denim shorts, with the exception of his sandals, turned completely white, with the former two taking on a more swirly, billowing appearance. The same steamy substance that accompanied his fourth gear form was back, but now it was much thicker and more cloud-like. Losing himself in his laughing fit, Luffy had a hand covering his eyes to hold back his tears of laughter as he continued bouncing, unaware of how his abilities were affecting the environment. At that moment, Rayleigh knew that, without a doubt, Luffy had finally achieved awakening. Luffy suddenly ceased his bouncing and sat upright before stretching his arms to grab the edge of the ditch. He rocketed out of the ditch, leaving Rayleigh to lick his wounds. The old man wasn't sure how to deal with the situation. Despite building up Luffy's strength and abilities to awaken his devil fruit, he neglected to plan for what might happen once they made it to the final stage. Now that the moment of truth has arrived, there was little that he could do to stop Luffy, especially since he was still fatigued after sparring seriously for a whole day. Without a plan to stop Luffy's ridiculous outburst of power, the Dark King decided to leave him alone. After all, he just reached the peak of his devil fruit powers. It was unpredictable what he was capable of now. Let him enjoy the experience until he runs out of steam. Rayleigh admits defeat before succumbing to the effects of Luffy's conqueror's hack. He smiles proudly and lets sleep take over. You've finally surpassed me. Luffy, Luffy had no idea what was happening to him, or around him, but he was having too much fun to care. He opened his eyes to reveal that they now had red ring-like pupils that glowed with power. Looking around him, the newly awakened rubber man found himself airborne high above Lascana. Down below, the massive animals, who were woken up by the sounds of intense laughter, stepped out onto the damaged clearing to look up at the source of the noise. They saw a strangely shaped figure in a triumphant pose captured in the foreground of the moon, its silhouette forming in the background. Luffy's laughing fit finally starts to settle down. Keeping himself airborne with Moonwalk, he assesses the situation of what he was feeling. What's happening to me? I feel great. I feel so free. I feel like I can do anything. My heartbeat sounds so funny. He cheered before patting his white shorts and tugging on the cloud that was wrapped around him. Isn't this? He gasps in realization. Is this what awakening feels like? Overcome with curiosity, Luffy dove down toward the ground, preparing to test out his new powers. Just before contact, Luffy flipped over to land on his feet. On impact, the ground felt and gave way like rubber. The animals that were watching him fell victim to his conqueror's hacky and fainted. For a brief moment, he remembered a lecture that Rayleigh gave him about devil fruit users achieving awakening and how their powers will also affect the environment around them. Since Luffy's devil fruit gave him a body made of rubber, that meant that everything he touches will be made of rubber too. In other words, everything around him was now his to control. Luffy smiled wildly as he stretched deep into the rubbery earth until he came to a stop. Gum gum. 
He launches himself back into the sky, making the ground shake with its elasticity. Trampoline. He shot up into the air like a mortar, along with all the loose rocks that littered his surroundings before they came crashing back down. With every ounce, he laughed with absolute glee as he continued to defy the laws of physics. He continued to jump around the island like his own personal playground for the remainder of the night. Luffy cannot recall ever having this much fun in his life. The intense brightness of the summer sun shined once again on the dented island of Lascana. Luffy slowly opened his eyes, his vision blurry at first. As he blinked a few times, the surroundings came into focus, and he realized he was lying on a log in the familiar campsite on Lascana. Memories flooded back to him, his moment of awakening his devil fruit. With a groan, Luffy pushed himself up into a sitting position, rubbing the back of his head. He could still feel the dull ache from the impact of his mentor's powerful attacks. Memories of their battle filled his mind. Flashes of Rayleigh's lightning-fast movements and the overwhelming force behind each blow, to the thrilling adrenaline of having absolute freedom in his new rubbery powers. As Luffy looked around, he noticed Rayleigh sitting nearby, patching himself up with a calm expression on his face. Their eyes met, and Luffy couldn't help but offer a sheepish grin. Hey, old man, how long was I out? Luffy asked, his voice still slightly groggy. Rayleigh chuckled softly, sheathing his sword. Hard to tell. I was out before you were. You took quite the beating, but you got right back up. Imagine my surprise when I saw you turning white and laughing like a man possessed. Luffy's eyes widened. Memories of what happened after their spar coming back to him in bits and pieces. He recalled how easy it was to move around. The thrill of being able to fly freely and turn everything he touched into rubber. He truly had the time of his life. You've finally done it, Luffy, Rayleigh said, his voice filled with pride. Your hacky has reached its peak. And your attacks have evolved into their full potential. All that's left is to learn how to control your awakened abilities. Remember, there's always room for growth. Never stop pushing yourself. Luffy grinned, feeling a renewed sense of determination. He knew that his journey to become the king of the pirates was far from over, and he had much more to learn. Thanks, Rayleigh, Luffy said, excitement evident in his voice. I never would have made it this far without you. Rayleigh nodded approvingly, a glimmer of excitement in his eyes. It was my pleasure, Luffy. Your potential has surpassed my own, and I look forward to seeing you claim Roger's legacy. With that, Rayleigh pushed himself up to his feet, putting his supplies away and putting his arms through his backpack. Where are you going? Luffy asked. I have nothing left to teach you. Luffy, Rayleigh answered with a smile. And, while I'd love to stick around, I need to return to Sabayati and finish the coating on your ship. Are you staying here? Luffy couldn't help but feel a surge of loneliness at the thought of Rayleigh leaving. He had been the only real person he could talk to during his training. With the exception of the Kuja pirates during the Biandi World incident, he was truly grateful for the guidance and support that his mentor provided for him, but he knew their journey together had to eventually end. He knew that the path to becoming the king of the pirates would be arduous, filled with all sorts of conflicts, including being alone, but he was filled with a burning passion and unwavering determination. He knew that he'll reunite with his friends soon. Well, it's been a year and nine months since I sent out that message to my crew, Luffy reminded himself. 3D2Y, Rayleigh said, remembering the message. Two years later instead of three days later, right? Luffy nodded. If we want to continue our journey, we all need to get stronger. After what happened, I'm sure they feel the same way. You still got three months. That should be plenty of time for you to get your awakened powers under control. Yeah, Luffy perked up with a bright smile. I can't wait to see how much the others have changed after two years. I've still got work to do if I want to protect them and their dreams. So, I'll stay here and work out all the kinks until time's up. Good, Rayleigh nodded in agreement. Soon, you'll be able to control your powers however you like. Luffy gazed at Rayleigh, gratitude and determination shining in his eyes. You got it. Rayleigh smiled warmly, his weathered face reflecting years of experience. The old man reaches into his backpack and pulls out a red bundle with a yellow cloth tied around it, then throws it to Luffy. Here, a little going away present. Luffy caught the bundle, feeling heavier than it looked. Untying the knot that held it together, a variety of items came falling out into his lap. Stretching out the fabrics, they revealed to be a red, long-sleeved cardigan with four buttons, and the yellow cloth turned out to be a sash, specifically designed to wrap around one's waist. Rayleigh thought he could use a new change of clothes when it was time to leave. The items on his lap consisted of all of Dr. Vegapunk's Devil Fruit Encyclopedia books, a hefty stack of cash worth about BH, 10 million in notes, and an intact pair of familiar handcuffs. Luffy curiously picked up the handcuffs to confirm his suspicion. When his fingers made contact, he instantly felt a tingle go through his whole body. They were definitely made from sea prism stone. What's all this for? Luffy asked in surprise. It's a reward for all your hard work, Rayleigh answered proudly. I got those handcuffs from the World Pirate ship while you were busy. I took them in case we needed a spare set to use for your training. 
but you've improved so fast that they became redundant. Why don't you hold on to them? I'm sure your crew could put them to good use. Luffy scrunched his face before taking a moment to think. I'll bet Usopp and Frankie could make all sorts of things out of this stuff. I'll have to remember to keep an eye out for more on our journey. Rayleigh gave him a nod before turning to walk away to the shoreline. I'll see you back on Sabayati in three months. Rayleigh says before informing him, the Kuja pirates will pick you up a week before you have to meet your crew. They'll know where to find you. Thanks, Rayleigh, for everything. As Rayleigh disappears out of sight, Luffy couldn't help but feel sad at being alone after all the time they spent together. But, while his strength had indeed grown, so did his mental capabilities, mostly thanks to his grandfather's strict educational methods. Luffy had learned how to act more like a leader to his crew, including the virtues that came with those responsibilities. Patience was now a part of Luffy's vocabulary, a trait that he knew a certain cook would be more than happy about. As he looked up to the sky through the forest canopy, his eyes were filled with the determination to never stop growing. Time was fast approaching, and he was gonna treat each remaining day like it was his last. The sky's the limit. The white blankets of winter's snow covered the landscape. Luffy had spent the last few months on this secluded training ground, honing his awakened skills and pushing his limits to new heights. With the time to reunite with his crew only one week away, Luffy was getting ready to leave. With all his bare essentials already packed, all he had left to grab was his treasured straw hat. Luffy, a distant female voice called out. I'm coming, give me a sec. Luffy replied with relative volume. As the snow crushed beneath his sandals with every step, he made his way to where he left his most prized possession. He stopped in front of a short, fat tree surrounded by stones, some of them nearly as tall as himself. This was the only safe place on the island due to the pollen that the tree produces, which the animals find extremely repulsive. Luckily, it was tolerable to humans. Sitting on one of the stones was Luffy's straw hat, covered with snow, but still completely intact with Rayleigh's Viva card still tucked into the red band. Luffy let out a relieved sigh before smiling. Time really sneaks up on you, huh? Luffy muttered with an excited grin. Two years already. He reaches out to grab the top of his hat. Well, partner dot 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 the wait is finally over. He pulls the hat off the rock, letting the snow fall off of it before walking away with it in hand. Meanwhile, back at his campsite, the giant gorilla and alligator were sitting around the lit campfire, fighting over a large chunk of meat on the bone like a pair of bickering bruisers. Standing next to a nearby tree was Margaret, who was watching the beast's rough housing. Her observations were interrupted when the colossal lion appeared and prowled towards her dangerously. Margaret gasped, startled by the beast. She pulled out her snake weapon and pulled back an arrow. The lion roared in response, sensing the threat from the Amazon warrior. Hey, before either could make the first attack, they were suddenly interrupted by the commanding voice of Luffy, who casually walked towards them while holding his hat to his side. This caused all the beasts to suddenly freeze with fear at the sight of the rubber man. Find someone else to eat. She's my friend, Luffy said, his voice full of authority. He gave the animals a stern glare, emphasizing his warning, to which the beasts complied without complaint. Margaret sighed in relief before lowering her weapon. Hi, Luffy. The ship is all ready to sail. Give the word and we'll be off, she said happily. Got it. Thanks. As if on cue, the Boa sisters and the Kuja pirates appeared on the scene, all impressed at Luffy's commanding aura. Hancock giggled, I should have known. He's the boss of the whole island now, Sandersonia said. Luffy stopped in his tracks in front of the trio of beasts. Yeah, it's kind of a shame, Luffy said. I was originally planning on eating these guys, but after Rayleigh left three months ago, I was starting to feel lonely. So I decided to make friends with them instead. And I'd feel pretty bad if I ate my friends, right? Still, they do look pretty yummy. Luffy's new friends all lowered their big heads, mildly disappointed that their boss would still think of them as food. Don't you worry about food, Hancock said as she placed a hand on her cheek and blushed. I have all of your favorites ready and waiting on the ship. Since I'm so thoughtful, I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to get married right away. Two years later and she was still an oblivious, lovesick drama queen. Luffy, on the other hand, had matured enough to fully realize what Hancock's true intentions were by now. He saw her as a good friend, but nothing more, which made this next part all the harder on them both. Luffy turned and casually made his way towards Hancock, who was expecting some sort of intimate agreement to her proposal. Once Luffy stopped in front of her, he reached up and placed his hand gently on her shoulder. Hancock moaned slightly, flinching at the touch of the man she fell in love with. Listen, Hancock. Ow, oh, he said my name again. I can't marry you. Hancock gasped sharply with a look of horror, but when she saw the look in Luffy's eyes, she found a glint of fire in them, proving that Luffy was in serious mode. The pirate empress composed herself before letting Luffy continue. I'm gonna be king of the pirates one day. That means I'll be more free than anyone else in the world. How can I truly call myself a free man if I just trade it all away with something as binding as marriage? Hancock's reaction was another overly dramatic swoon. 
She moaned in delight before slouching and placing the back of her hand over her forehead. You're so wise, my dear. I've been such a fool. What was I thinking? I should be sad about your cold heart, yet mine is on fire. Luffy sighed, shaking his head in disappointment. Oh, well, I tried. With that display out of the way, Sandersonia decided to step in. Rayleigh informed us on the time to pick you up, so I'm guessing he's waiting for you at Sabayati now. She clarified. Yeah, Luffy confirmed. I learned everything he could possibly teach me. And then some. I've completely mastered Haki. Then awakened my devil fruit. He turns back toward his animal friends. All that's left is to say bye to these guys, now. As he got closer to them, he gave them all a genuine smile. So long, you guys. Thanks for keeping me company. The rubber man slowly places his trusty hat on his head, grinning with excitement and determination. Time to go. The bright sun illuminated the vast ocean as the perfume Yuta sailed through the calm waters of the Grand Line, carrying the captain of the Straw Hat Pirates, Monkey D. Luffy. After two long years of arduous training with the legendary Silver's Rayleigh, the time finally came for Luffy to reunite with his crew and continue their journey to the New World. Perched on the ship's bow, Luffy's excitement was palpable. He could hardly contain his anticipation. His eyes sparkled with unbridled enthusiasm as the sight of his destination slowly rose on the horizon. I see it. Luffy called out to the Kuja pirates who were out on the deck. I can see Sabayati. As the ship gradually neared the infamous archipelago, Luffy couldn't help but reminisce about the last time he had been there. It had been a chaotic and dangerous place, with powerful pirates and slave traders prowling the streets. But this time, things were different. Luffy had grown substantially more powerful, and his resolve to protect his friends burned brighter. Boa Hancock, dressed in her regal attire, stepped out onto the deck and stood behind Luffy. This is as far as we can go, Luffy. So we'll have to say our goodbyes here. Hancock said calmly. Luffy stepped off the bow at her voice and stood in front of the pirate empress. We cannot let anyone discover the nature of our relationship, she added. Hancock didn't show it, but Luffy could tell that she crying on the inside, not knowing when or if she'll ever see him again. I understand, Luffy nodded in reassurance. I've prepared. Hancock pauses as she pulls out a fake nose and mustache and holds it over her face. A disguise for you. Haha, are you kidding? Luffy chuckles. I can't pull that look off. Perhaps, but... Besides, Luffy holds up a finger, interrupting her, I have a much better disguise. Check this out. Luffy buries his hand into his hair, which suddenly turns a flaming white. He pulled out a chunk of the hair by a handful. The pulled hair then begins to shape and take the form of a white walrus mustache. Luffy placed his magically created facial hair over his upper lip and grinned proudly at his spectating benefactors while his hair changes back to its usual black. The entire crew reacted very comedically. Their jaws almost hit the floorboards, and their eyes were as wide as dinner plates. Oh, yeah, I guess you didn't know I could do that, huh? Luffy scratched the back of his head shyly. Ever since I achieved awakening, I can create things out of my hair. Pretty cool, huh? He gave the Kuja pirates a moment to recover from their awe since they were not used to seeing such a ridiculous display of power. Once the awkwardness had died down, Hancock walked closer to Luffy and pulled the hood of his cloak over his head. The pirate empress gave it to him from her personal wardrobe to conceal his identity from the world government while he makes his way to reunite with his crew. I suppose any disguise will work, but you must be careful, she said, adjusting the rim of Luffy's hood. Keep your face hidden at all times. The world may believe you've been dead these last two years, but that won't stop anyone from recognizing you the first time you get into trouble. So, if you ever want to set sail again, you'll take my advice to heart. I'll do my best. Luffy nodded. Thanks. You're welcome. Hancock then walked over to an impossibly large and overstuffed backpack. Now, for supplies. I've loaded your backpack with 50 changes of clothes, 1,000 lunches, handkerchiefs, and tissues. You'll also find three years' worth of water, snacks, and bug bite ointment. There's also five years' worth of towels, toothbrushes, plenty of soaps, hand cream, and lots of silverware. That is entirely too much. Elder Nyon exclaimed loudly. But Hancock responded with the bashful smile of an entranced schoolgirl. There's no need for all that, Luffy said modestly. I'll just take half and use it as my overnight bag. With that, the Kuja pirates helped lighten the load, which still left the backpack relatively big for Luffy's size. The elder still thought it was too much, though. But that didn't matter to Luffy. He rolled the backpack on its side before stepping into the straps, carrying it like a rope-tied mattress. He was now fully prepared to go ashore. Well, I hope you can find all your friends, said Margaret. Thanks again for the ride. Ladies, Luffy bowed respectfully, a gesture of etiquette that was literally beaten into him by his obstinate grandfather. Dot 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 and for the supplies. Margaret giggled. We were more than happy to help you. Your most difficult trials may still be ahead of you, sweet pea warned. I hear that Sabayati has become a den of crime. MMHM, Elder Nyan nodded. And because of that, the Navy has been keeping a tight watch over the goings on there as of late, my boy. 
so be sure to take extra care. Sweet Pea warned again. Will do. Luffy gave them a thumbs up. If you ever need assistance, the full force of the Kyuja pirates will come rushing to your aid at a moment's notice, Hancock reassured. Please, don't hesitate to call on us. The pirate empress then turned away with a faint blush on her cheeks. Also, would you be willing to do me a favor? I already said I can't marry you, Luffy jumped the gun. No, no, Hancock bashfully denied. All I ask is that, when you leave, you do so. Without saying farewell, she asked, curiosity mingling with concern. After a moment of silence, Luffy took a deep breath. He had never had to say that to anybody in his entire life, since they were either enemies that he beat up or friends that he wanted to see again. And Luffy knew exactly which side he wanted Boa Hancock to stay on, looking directly into her eyes. Hancock, he spoke with sincerity. You've done so much for me, risked so much. I can't repay you enough. Reaching out, Luffy gently took one of Hancock's hands into his own. Time seemed to stand still as Luffy's lips met Hancock's delicate skin. The world around them faded away, leaving only the warmth of their bond. For Luffy, it was a simple gesture of gratitude, but also an acknowledgement of the sacrifices and unwavering support Hancock had shown him. Hancock's eyes widened and gasped deeply, surprised by the depth of Luffy's gratitude. She felt a flurry of emotions, her heart fluttering at his genuine display of appreciation. Hancock's breath hitched as she felt the soft touch of Luffy's lips on her hand. It was a gesture that stirred something deep within her, a connection that transcended words. Her heart swelled with a mix of emotions, gratitude, affection, and an amplified, undeniable fondness for the young captain. As Luffy pulled away, his eyes met Hancock's, a mixture of determination and kindness shining within them. Thank you so much for everything, Hancock, he said softly. I won't forget what you've done for me. You're a really important friend to me. A smile graced Hancock's lips, her eyes shining with a newfound warmth. Oh, Luffy dot 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 you have an extraordinary ability to touch the hearts of those around you, she whispered, her voice filled with admiration. You've repaid me with your sincerity, and for that, I'm grateful. Their bond, strengthened by Luffy's heartfelt gesture, held a promise of unwavering support and friendship as their journey together comes to an end. Many of the Kuja pirates, mostly the Boa sisters, were still comprehending the amount of affection that Luffy displayed to their beloved empress. See ya, Moonwalk. With one final goodbye, Luffy tightens his hold on his backpack before leaping off the deck and flying towards Sabayati Archipelago, playfully stroking his temporary, white facial hair. Despite its name, Sabayati Archipelago is actually a massive mangrove forest growing out of the ocean floor, 10,000 meters below sea level. These towering plants were called Hustle Muscle Mangroves. They all had natural, white vertical stripes from top to bottom with large numbers written on each tree. Each tree, or grove, serves as an island on which people can live and build a community. The locals go from one grove to another via man-made bridges that connect around the tree roots. The unique quality of these mangroves is that they are capable of producing a special type of tree sap resin. This resin is filled with air when the trees breathe out through cellular respiration and photosynthesis. This results in the resin forming bubbles that float through the air. Since the resin bubbles are solid and durable enough to lift a person's body weight without popping, the locals have adapted to using this resin in their everyday lives, including merchandising and infrastructure. The archipelago has a total of 79 groves, dividing them into several different areas, with each one dependent on the area. Groves 1-29 are the lawless areas where criminals and bounty hunters run amok. Groves 30-39 has the bubble-themed amusement park attraction, Sabayati Park. Groves 4-49 is a tourist spot filled with various shops and souvenir stands. Groves 5-59 is the shipping area. Groves 6-69 houses the local marines' headquarters. And finally, Groves 7-79 is where you'll find all the hotels. The familiar sights and sounds brought a mix of nostalgia and excitement. As Luffy landed gracefully on the large mangrove route that housed the familiar establishment, he couldn't help but wonder if his friends were inside too. Determined to find out, he dropped his backpack and hurried through the front door. Entering the bar, Luffy's eyes darted around, searching for any familiar faces. And then, his gaze settled on a figure at the counter. It was none other than his mentor, the Dark King, Silver's Rayleigh. The old man was enjoying a shot of whiskey on the rocks. Leaning behind the counter was another familiar face. Shakayaku, Akashaki, a slim and tall woman with short black hair, holding a lit cigarette. She looked very young despite being in her 60 seconds. Despite their differences in appearance, Rayleigh and Shaki are partners in both business and life. Well, Shaki couldn't help but smile. We were just talking about you, monkey. About time you showed up, Rayleigh said as he turned toward Luffy, his eyes glowing with warmth. Hi, Rayleigh. Hi, Shaki. Luffy greeted the elders with a wave and a wide grin of joy across his face. Good to see you guys again. Before Luffy got a response, Luffy's advanced observation Haki sensed an incoming attack from the counter. 
The next instant, Shaki placed her cigarette on an ashtray and then disappeared before reappearing in front of Luffy. Her leg raised up high, about to deliver a heavy axe kick. Luffy, being the bona fide hacky master that he is, hardened his fist with hacky before stopping Shaki's attack by catching her by the ankle with ease. Shaki's eyes widened at how easily the rubber man stopped her attack. She didn't even make him flinch. Shaki suddenly jumped back after Luffy generously loosened his grip. He didn't bother putting his guard up since he was able to sense no malicious intent from the bar owner. Shaki gave Luffy a satisfied smile before returning to behind the counter. What was that about? Luffy asked, tilting his head in confusion. Shaki and I were discussing your crewmates and their order of arrival, Rayleigh answered. Since you were the last to arrive, Luffy, she wouldn't believe me when I told her that you surpassed me, so she volunteered to test you if you ever stopped by the bar. Sorry about that. Monkey, Shaki apologized smoothly. I guess my husband wasn't just pulling my hair. She then motions for Luffy to take a seat at the counter. Can I get you anything, hun? Luffy grinned as he took a seat next to Rayleigh. Got any meat? Shaki chuckled, picking up her cigarette and placing it between her lips. Of course, but I've got something even better for you today. How about I introduce you to a new world of taste? Intrigued, Luffy leaned forward, his eyes gleaming with curiosity. A new world of taste? What do you mean? Shaki went to the shelf behind her, which displayed a collection of differently labeled bottles, before returning with a tray holding various bottles filled with colorful liquids. She lined them up in front of Luffy, who observed them with fascination. Each bottle bore a different label, promising a unique and exciting experience. You're 19 now, isn't that right? Shaki asked. MMHM, Luffy nodded. That means you're old enough to drink alcohol, Shaki explained, her voice tinged with excitement. They come in different flavors and strengths. People all around the world enjoy them as a way to unwind and celebrate. I want to see if your taste buds have matured as well. Luffy's eyes widened with anticipation. I've never had booze before. Are they tasty? Shaki nodded, pouring a small amount of the golden liquid into a glass. They can be, but be warned, some are quite strong, and too much can make you lose control. Luffy leaned in closer, curiosity getting the better of him. I'll try it. It may not be meat, but I'm open to new things. I want to taste all of them. With a laugh, Shaki handed Luffy the glass. He raised it to his lips and took a sip, his face lighting up with surprise and delight. The smooth and warm sensation danced across his taste buds, unlike anything he had ever experienced. His eyes widened as the warm, tingling sensation spread through his body. The taste was unlike anything he had experienced before, complex, yet somehow comforting. As Luffy continued to sample the different alcoholic beverages, Rayleigh's eyes gleamed mischievously as he observed his former student's reaction. How is it, Luffy? Not bad, Luffy said, a smile spreading across his face. It tastes like a special kind of adventure in itself. I can see why Zoro drinks this stuff all the time. The elder couple chuckled at that aspect of one of Luffy's friends. Speaking of, so, you said I was the last one to arrive, Luffy reminded before his excitement escalated. Does that mean everyone else made it back? That's right, Shaki clarified. Duval and his gang were here earlier but you just missed them. They suffered a lot of injuries while they were defending your ship. Your friends all stopped here, one after the other. They're all currently out wandering the archipelago to kill time. Oh yeah, the Sunny. Luffy exclaimed happily. How is she? There's not a scratch on her, Rayleigh said. We finished the coating, too. That's great. Luffy smiled with relief. Thanks, old man. Just make sure to give credit where credit's due. The old man nodded before bringing up the elephant in the room. By the way, Luffy, I couldn't help but notice that white mustache. Is it a fake? Oh, Luffy quipped before casually tearing off the white facial hair. Yeah, it's fake. Hancock made me promise to stay discreet until my crew and I can sail away. I don't blame her. After you caused such a stir at Marineford, the whole world is after you. Wouldn't want them knowing you're still alive just yet. Speaking of, Shaki added before pulling out a sheet of paper that depicted the Straw Hat Pirate's Jolly Roger with a message written around it. I thought I should mention that your crew has become more renowned than you thought. Luffy took a closer look at the sheet of paper. Urgent crew needed. Curiosity peaked. Luffy carefully read the contents. His eyes widened as he discovered it was an advertisement for new crew members, seeking to join the Straw Hats. Confusion clouded his features as he scanned the details. But I'm not looking for new crew members. We're already the Straw Hat Pirates. I don't need scrubs on my crew. Unless, his face furrowed in realization and frustration. Imposters, determined to unravel the mystery, Luffy stood up from his seat before marching toward the front door. It was great seeing you both again, but I've gotta get to the bottom of this. The couple nodded understandingly. We understand, Luffy. But listen closely, Rayleigh began, his voice carrying the weight of his experience. The key is to unveil these imposters' true identities. Seek out those who know us best, our friends and allies. They can help you distinguish between the genuine straw hat pirates and the pretenders. Rayleigh warned, his voice laced with wisdom. 
Agreed, Shaki added. You must gather information, follow any leads, and expose the truth. With that, you can put an end to this deception and protect the honor of your crew. Luffy nodded, his determination flaring as he absorbed Rayleigh's words. His fists clenched, and a fire burned in his eyes. Yeah, I won't let anyone tarnish my crew's good name. He declared with unwavering resolve. With nothing more to say, the straw hat captain rushed out of the bar, closing the door behind him. After leaving the bar, Luffy immediately zipped across several groves with his backpack until he spotted the first sign of civilization. Luffy's first steps into the district were met with a whirlwind of activity. The bustling streets were filled with merchants, pirates, and curious onlookers. The straw hat imposters seemed to have caused quite a stir, and Luffy was keeping his ears open for any whispers about their whereabouts echoing through the crowd. With a keen sense of purpose and his identity concealed, Luffy weaved through the chaotic streets, his gaze fixed on his goal. He visited shady taverns, frequented any potential pirate hangouts, and followed any lead that might bring him closer to the imposters. As he casually walked through the bustling streets filled with shops and souvenir stands, Luffy immediately noticed the increasing number of pirates hanging around compared to two years ago. Some were skulking in the alleys, while some were fighting each other in the middle of the streets. All the locals were either watching their skirmishes play out or decided not to get involved. I bet a lot of these pirates intend on joining the crew of those fakers, Luffy pondered. I need to find a place where lots of pirates gather. Luffy continued to stroll through the busy streets, his senses honed for any signs of deception while looking from shop to shop for any suspicious characters. As much as he wanted to, he would much rather find his friends first. As much as he wanted to, he couldn't find them that easily, even with his advanced hacky sense he doesn't know what their auras feel like. As Luffy delved deeper into the heart of Sabayati Archipelago, he stopped when he noticed a sobbing figure blindingly running towards him, or, in this case, galloping. The figure was a full-grown, reindeer wearing a blue, round cap with a sideways medical cross on the front, a blue backpack with the same sideways cross, a white and yellow striped tank top, and a pair of orange shorts. After a quick observation, the final clincher was the crying buck's remarkable blue nose. Chopper, okay sadly the chapter is over, and if you enjoyed the video just leave a like, and subscribe with post notification, so when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.